Hello everyone, how's it going? Hope you've all had a great PSR marathon so far. Awesome XD run that just wrapped up by uh, Kid Rocker there. I am TTS for life, and I'm going to be showcasing White 2 for you all today. So uh, I'm going to be starting off here in the DS menu screen, because like any normal DS manip that you have may or may not have seen before, I need to start this in the uh, menu screen here, setting some time and date. So I'm going to go ahead and do that uh, now. And time is going to officially begin when I go ahead and boot my DS back up. And then um, as soon as like the Nintendo DS like title screen clears, um, that is when the run will officially start. And I will uh, announce that when we get there for our wonderful timer person behind the scenes. So. So mine starts at the 35 second. So I'm turning off my DS now. So I'm going to be holding some buttons to help influence my RNG, and time starts now. All right, so Pokemon White 2. Um, if you've seen any other DS Pokemon run before, you know the gist. We got to get eight badges, uh, BP Elite 4, the champion. Some bad guy shenanigans on the way, nothing that uh, comes off as a surprise, but uh, something that I really like about this game is kind of the pacing of it. Uh, I definitely think that this game is a lot faster paced compared to some of the other uh, games out there, especially on the DS. If you've ever played a Gen 4 game before, you know the, uh, the whole deal there. So uh, just doing some basic stuff here, just setting a trainer name and rival name, setting them to one character in order to make things as... Uh, quick as possible because even though the text goes really really fast in this game we still want to make sure that uh, we set things to be as quick as possible so less characters to print on screen with your name means that um, text goes by faster so one little mechanic about the generation 5 games is the seasons I am playing in the autumn season there are three different seasons realistically that you would play in um, you could play in the spring, the fall, or the winter. Uh, you don't really want to play in uh, in the summer season, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, I really like autumn because it is the one of the nicer looking seasons, in my opinion. Um, but it's also not really a choice what season you play in. It just kind of depends on some of the RNG stuff and how that um, plays in your favor. So. When it comes to RNG in this game, there's quite a few factors that go into creating an RNG seed. Um, one of the first and most notable ones was the time and date when I had set that. Um, booting the Generation 5 games uh, accurate to the second uh, can give you a certain RNG seed, so there is no frame perfect window that I need to hit compared to like the generation four games or uh, I know a lot of the other generations have some like one frame windows to uh, hit certain RNG minutes and stuff. This generation is really nice because I only have that one second window that I need to hit to boot the game and everything else is pretty much set in stone from there. So uh, some of the other stuff that matters though, uh, in addition to date and time that uh, doesn't happen in like generation four games for example would be uh, my key presses so i kind of mentioned it briefly when i was booting the game but on certain uh, buttons kind of influence the rng in different ways so i have a specific button combo that allows me to hit the seed that i have here um, that will give me a tepig with perfect stats now uh, when i boot the game the tepig stats are as perfect as they can get uh, however, I still need to make sure that I get the correct nature on it. So I'm being very meticulous with my movement here, just to make sure that I do not um, end up with a different nature. The nature that I'm looking for in particular is Rash, which is plus special attack and minus special defense. And I'm just going to be focused on mashing here to make sure that I get what I want. All right, that should be good, so we should have our rash with no problem. Uh, 
Um, so the other things that influence the seed that I didn't really mention um, is known as timer zero. So timer zero is a hardware level timer that is really, really fast and really, really hard to control. Uh, it is something that we can make consistent um, messing with what are known as DS parameters. Uh, DS parameters, um, as we call them, are just simply like the nickname of your DS, the color theme, um, a DS comment, which I think is relevant to like PictoChat. If you're like PictoChatting other people, you can have like a custom message there or whatever. Um, but the deal is, is that um, those can influence your timer zero to be one of a couple different values. And um, having that be the correct value is what also helps you hit the seed. So. For those keeping track at home, that's date and time accurate to the second, your key presses, and your timer zero. And that all kind of comes together into what is your RNG seed. Um, so now that we have our perfect starter, I'm going to be checking here. My tepig should be a male. Good, that means I hit it. Uh, I was really scared of hitting the frame beyond it, which is sassy. Um, it's not the end of the world if I got the wrong nature because I still have at least a really bulky tepig and the nature that um, follows my rash like frame, uh, which is sassy, uh, doesn't really hurt me in any way. So really glad to hit that in a marathon. I don't really have much of a backup um, because another piece of the RNG that I completely forgot to mention for some reason uh, is your MAC address. So each DS has its own MAC address, and because of that, everyone's a manip is unique. So the movement that I have done to get to my Tepig so far, as well as the time and date and key presses, all that uh, will be different than someone else because we have different MAC addresses. So because one piece is unique to every console, everyone has to come up with their own unique manips. So one thing about this game is that the intro is really quick. So Bianca is just kind of giving us a feel about a center here after our first real quick rival fight. Um, we're going to be pretty much let off the leash and able to explore the game pretty quickly compared to especially a lot of the later generation games that uh, tend to get a little long winded sometimes. So uh, I kind of talked about how RNG seeds are created, but I haven't really talked about how those seeds translate into like the RNG for stuff like stats, nature, um, movement for no encounters, which we'll be doing here for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, just to make things as quick as possible, because we don't actually get access to repels until after the first gym, so I'm going to be dodging as many encounters as possible by holding RNG minute for a long time, just so that um, we could save as much time as possible. We're also going to be talking to this receptionist here because she gives us a potion, and if we didn't talk to her, uh, she would kind of pull us in to tell us about it, and it's just a little faster to go talk to her. So then Bianca is going to teach us the catching tutorial here, and then we're kind of on our way. So kind of getting back to the RNG talk that I'm definitely not getting sidelined on every time I think of something to talk about um, is that there are two different kind of RNGs working at the same time. There's what's known as the pit RNG. The pit RNG determines um, a lot of the overworld stuff that you would see on the surface, um, including like NPC movements, uh, whether or not I get an encounter, uh, which encounter slot I get if I do get an encounter, uh, and then on top of that, like that encounters like nature and ability and all that gender, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then there's what's known as the IVRNG. So the IVRNG kind of works a little more under the hood and isn't as well known, um, or at least well like noticed to like the naked eye. The IVRNG, um, as the name implies, determines your IVs. So IVs, in case you uh, have been under a rock the entire PSR marathon, because I'm sure it's been brought up a couple dozen times by now. Uh, IVs are on a scale of 0 to 31, how good a particular stat is for that Pokemon of its species. So um, the IV RNG kind of just picks like the top five numbers um, that are coming up in the RNG to determine, um, or six numbers, sorry, for those six stats that each Pokemon has. Uh, and then it'll keep grabbing from the next one over and over and over. However, the IV RNG only really increments uh, when you're in battle. And when you're in battle, it increments uh, once 
once or twice every frame at 60 FPS. The battles are all 60 FPS in Gen 5, which make them very pleasing to look at. The overworld is only 30 FPS, by the way. Um, so that IVRNG is moving really, really, really fast. So even though I have a couple more planned catches, and I know exactly what those catches are going to be, I'm going to know exactly what Pokemon I'm catching and its nature, um, I won't know uh, its IVs, however. Uh, for the most part, however, that's not an issue. Um, but it is something to note that anytime I'm in a battle, I can't be manipulating IV RNG. However, I am still manipulating pit RNG as I move around in the overworld here. I'm being very meticulous with my movement so that um, I can get no encounters except for the ones that I want. So we got our first uh, trainer fight here against Terrell. Sometimes you can get really lucky. Uh, a crit sometimes kills the trap. Um, most commonly, it's going to be a three shot though. Uh, I took quite a bit of damage there, which isn't great, but we'll see what comes from it here as we go on. I do have uh, some potions to use in case I need to heal at any point. Um, so with using Rash, um, it's a little different than what um, you might run if you're going to pick up White 2 for the first time and are interested in picking up this game. Uh, most runners will opt for a Naughty Tepig instead of a Rash. Um, Rash is kind of a better top end, but this is a lot more riskier for um, reasons I'm going to get into uh, as they come up. Uh, but with Naughty, you get a little more consistent of an early game, so it's just a little bit better for you to... Um, to like, get through the early game. So I meant to catch that pit of, but marathon luck, I crit it. So we're gonna have to do some improvisation later. Uh, not great, but it doesn't mean I've lost Minip either. Uh, I should still be able to get the next Pokemon I intend to catch, which is a Psyduck. So hopefully that will not be an issue. It might break my Minip a little later. Uh, we'll see. Um, so definitely stick around for the chaos here. So I'm going to tail whip uh, Oshawa once just because uh, that makes it uh, that first tackle there have a chance. Um, if it crits to kill Oshawa, so then I can uh, skip you coming out and BSing about uh, me damaging his Pokemon. It's a huge time save if you get that crit because um, it's always a guaranteed kill, but what can you do? So we're delivering the town map to Hugh, um, Hugh's little sister who was with our mother when we got the town maps. Uh, she gave us two so that we would give one to Hugh, so we're kind of doing that now. Kind of a Gen 4, you know, callback thing with that, so. Um, but now the ranch owners here who have come up to us causing chaos in their ranch uh, want us to help them find their missing Herdier. So we're gonna go run off and do that. And NPCs still look good. Um, so I should still have Manip to catch my Psyduck here, even though I don't have my Pidove. My Pidove would be intended to use for Fly, um, but obviously that's not the case because I crit it. Um, that Pidove is guaranteed to die in a crit, and even if you don't crit, it's a one in 16 for it to die to a high roll tackle. Because uh, how damage calculation works in the main series Pokemon games is there's 16 different values um, that you could deal of damage up from 85 to 100% of an attack's power. Uh, once it goes through all the kind of damage calculation stuff, it'll do that. Um, a lot of the numbers are going to end up being the same, uh, depending on your stats and the enemy stats and if they're kind of around the same kind of like power level. All right, so we caught our Psyduck here. Our Psyduck uh, is manipped to have the ability Damp. Uh, Damp lets us not have the other ability that Psyduck has, which is Cloud 9 proc every time it goes into battle. Because uh, we will be using Psyduck in a couple of fights, not to like actually contribute to the fight, uh, but because a mechanic to Gen 5 known as Triple Battles um, requires us to have three Pokemon. So the plan was to have uh, Pit Up and Psyduck be there to kind of be our um, support while we kind of take care of everything with our main. 
So having only um, one of the two is fine because I can back up Pit of pretty easily. Uh, it's a lot better to back up Pit of than it is to back up Psyduck IMO. Uh, to back up Psyduck, I would have to be catching an Audino with a Master Ball that I get about midway through the game. Uh, but it would also require me to hold on to um, Pig Knight for a while, which I would like to get rid of as uh, soon as I typically can. So um, this will just mean that I have to catch a Zubat in Castilia Sewers. Um, I don't remember what <laughs> encounter ch chances they are in the sewers, uh, or their chance to catch, or my plan to catch one. Uh, so we will see how that goes when we get there. Um, the Psyduck there was a little rough to catch. It was uh, about a coin flip to catch uh, with just the tackle there. You can use Tail Whip to weaken it so that you get a little closer to about uh, a three quarters chance to catch it with each ball. Um, but I don't want to also crit Psyduck and uh, lose that one too. So we're coming up on the kind of uh, fights that are meant to teach you about uh, type effectiveness here. This Pan Sage and coming up a Pan Pour are meant to teach you super effective versus not very effective with uh, Ember. Uh, we're going to use Ember on Pan Sage because it's obviously super effective. Um, that's not great. <laughs> Actually, six is fine if most of you could. Okay. That was interesting. Uh, so yeah, these things have Lick, which is a 30% chance to paralyze, and then a 25% chance to just lose a turn because uh, you're paralyzed. So that was not great. Um, but it worked out, I guess. Um, so this pan four, we're going to be using Tail Whip and then spamming Tackle. Um, you also may have noticed that as I'm kind of running through the early game here that I have been working on uh, picking up some X items. Uh, you don't get X items in this game from a shop until very, very late in the game. Uh, so we don't get a ton of opportunities to use them. Or, well, we have to be really careful with how we choose to use them and when. Um, there are two fights in particular that we're going to be using um, our X attack in the X speed, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but those are the only two X items that we're going to be using in the run because we just don't get access to them until right before the seventh gym. And at that point, we have much better uh, Pokemon move setups, etc., to make things better for us. So. So this metal guy is going to chase us about metals. We don't care. Um, he's just kind of filler in the intro here. Uh, but we're almost done with holding our RNG manipulation, assuming that I still have RNG manipulation. Um, movement looks pretty good overall. This looks very recognizable, so I should be able to at least hold Manip up until the gate, even though I don't have the Padov that I would like to have at this point, so that's really good. So Aldo's going to give us Orin Berries here, which are actually pretty useful um, in certain situations uh, coming up here. So uh, not a completely useless item to be giving us. Um, and this is kind of like the end of like the intro to the game, per se, because now we're off to the first gym. Um, so kind of heading back to his first year here. This is the one game that has a gym in the same town that you start in, uh, which I think is a pretty unique... Uh, like quirk that makes Wake 2 stand out a little bit compared to other games, so. Uh, it is in the back of this trainer school, so I gotta run all the way back here to enter the quote-unquote gym, which is just kind of like the school courtyard or whatever.
All right, so in order to fight Charon, we're going to have to beat up the two gym trainers that stand before him. So um, nothing too special here. I'm going to be looking for as many uh, crits and burns as I can get with the tackles and embers I'm going to be using. Uh, this rat here is a 59%. Yeah, that first roll looked pretty rough, so I didn't think I was going to get it. Um, I would like to get Blaze before Charon if possible, but I'm not begging for it. Um, there's a couple different ways to handle Charon depending on um, the health that you're in and whatnot. So I'm taking a lot of damage here in the beginning, which I'm not complaining against because if I do get Blaze like on the next fight, I can take advantage of it. Um, but I don't want to get too destroyed. So. Hoping for a good burn here to finish this pup off. No? Alright. But now I do have Blaze, so now I should just be able to use two embers to kill this uh, threat that's coming up. Uh, it's a 12% to kill otherwise, so uh, this makes it a guaranteed two shot. Just like that. Uh, getting tackle there is not great because I'm going to have to kill this now. Uh, yeah, I'm getting level 13 early. That's right, because I filled the pit up and got 9 extra XP. Did you look at that? Alright, so being at this health, I'm going to go ahead and use one of the Orin Berries that uh, I was gifted by um, Alder, and then I'm going to go ahead and register the Berry Bag, because this game has a nice thing where if I uh, press Y in a certain menu to register, um, what happens is that I can um, kind of speed up the process of going into the bag by just pressing Y instead of having to press X and then uh, navigate to the specific bag that I, or like the item slot in my bag or whatever it's called. So I'm not in Blaze, so I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be starting off with uh, two tackles and then uh, Ember. Well, I guess I am level 15, so I'm going to do a lot more damage with everything against this rat. Would have been a, not a bad idea to kill it, and then just tackle or something. Not sure. Doesn't matter. Um, I did take a safety save in case I die here. Um, dying is not great with Rash because I'm speed tied against this Lola pup. And if I lose my fresh water, that just makes things really awkward. Um, so hopefully I can just get through this fight no issue, and then just win the relative speed tie. This should be a guaranteed win for my 15. Perfect. Alright, and at least we're through Charon in one shot, so that's not too bad. I could have used Defense Curl. You don't typically teach Defense Curl um, in an any percent run. I could have considered uh, doing it if I wanted to be safe, but I wasn't too worried about it, so. I uh, get the TM for work up here, uh, which we're not gonna make use of in normal mode. If we were playing challenge mode, um, then we would teach it to our uh, Tepig at some point, but. Um, for those who aren't aware, there are two different modes or uh, difficulties in this game. There's normal mode and challenge mode. There's also easy mode, but we don't talk about easy mode at all because it sucks. Uh, but challenge mode uh, is nice because it gives a lot of the gym leaders some extra pokes. I like Charon there would have had four instead of two, which makes that fight really brutal. Um, but it also gives them a uh, little better IVs. Uh, most trainers have zero IVs except for like significant trainers. Usually they will have pokes with a couple of IVs depending on um, like what stage in the game you're in. So like Charon here I think has six IVs across the board or something like that. So, um, But obviously he would get buffed a little more in um, challenge mode to make things more difficult. Um, there is a category for challenge mode. That's not what we're running today, unfortunately. Uh, 
It is also kind of a pain to set up challenge mode because you need to have the challenge mode key, which you can get from transferring over from a Black 2's completed save file, because you don't unlock the extra difficulties until after you uh, beat the week four. And to get the challenge mode key, you have to beat Black 2. Uh, White 2 gives you the easy mode key from beating the game, so. Uh, that being said, I do have the challenge mode key on my DS, even though I am playing on normal mode. Uh, that's because it does influence the RNG a little bit. Uh, so if I was playing challenge mode, um, I could run with these exact same... Let me focus on shopping here quick. Do that, that... And not that many. A lot of extra money. Where did that extra money not go to? The extra supers? I bought the antidote. I bought the repellents. Bought the two escape ropes. So, whatever. whatever. Um, should be good on menuing. I bought an extra antidote there, which I don't normally do, but I'm going to do it for safety because uh, the next gym that we're coming up on is poison type, which makes things uh, a little annoying if we get poisoned, so I'm going to have uh, just an extra antidote on hand to take care of that. Um, yes, I can't use the escape rope right now. That's right. I bought things out of order. Uh, okay, so we now have access to repel, so I don't really need to worry about RNG manipulation anymore. Um, another thing about the RNG manipulation in this game is that whenever I receive a cross transceiver phone call, like I did after beating uh, Charon, the pit RNG, which controls the overworld and encounters and all that stuff, as I said earlier, uh, starts advancing really, 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 really fast, so it's hard to control, and it's hard to time uh, leaving that phone call at the same time, every single time. Um, you can, like, route, like, a bunch of clusters or, like, a specific frame that you're trying to hit in the RNG uh, coming out of that phone call so that you can still hold RNG here. Um, but all it really helps you with is one particular uh, spinner pass. So, uh, coming up on this Riolu fight here, it's a little bit of a troll because... Um, it has the move Endure, which um, makes it kind of like bolt down so that, um, so that even if I would kill it, it would kind of survive at 1 HP, even if it was at 1 HP. Um, so it's kind of like a get out of jail free card, or at least um, I'm not dead yet kind of card. Uh, it's a real pain. It's only attacking move is quick attack, which is also annoying because it's a priority move, which means you're forced to take damage if that happens. Um, in this case, I'm really happy that I took damage because that put me at 15 HP, which is exact HP for uh, Tepic's ability Blaze. Uh, Blaze is an ability that lets you boost your fire type attacks uh, by 1.5 times when I'm at or below 33% of my health. So I'm at Blaze right now and as best of Blaze as I can get without um, much risk. So. Um, so that's really great coming into this next gym, because this is where having Rash really excels. Uh, because I have that extra plus special attack with my Rash nature instead of Naughty, which is plus attack, uh, I get a couple ranges that are a little bit better in this gym because of the boosted special attack, because we will be using Ember quite a bit. And on the pokes that we use, uh, a move that we're going to be learning in a second called Flame Charge um, doesn't help as much. So. We're going to get some uh, lore here between the second gym leader, Roxy, and her dad, who is dead set on becoming a movie star. Nothing that we're particularly interested in, but something that we're definitely going to get roped into for way too long in the future. Uh, so in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and hop into Roxy's gym right away. Now, I equipped a Petra Berry on the Tepig when I was doing that... Uh, spinner pass there. I'll go a little more into spinners um, in a bit. Uh, but so that's so if I get hit with a move that is commonly used in here called poison gas, which has a pretty good chance of landing and then poisoning me, uh, I can instantly get rid of the poison without taking any um, like poison ticks at the end of a turn. 
or have the waste to turn using an antidote TPL. So I was given three patches by Charon. I'm really hoping that I can use all three of them without an issue. Um, so having Blaze here helps me one-shot as Menipede, no issue. And then now I'm going to be kind of playing it by ear on this coughing as to when I heal and with what. Uh, if I get a burn or a crit here, that's really good. There's seven, so I'm going to go ahead and orange to 17, just to be safe. And he hit me back in the Blaze, which is nice, because then I can two-shot him like that. Um, it is a 30% chance with Rash for me to two-shot with uh, two Blaze Embers like that, so I'm really glad that worked out. And I also did not lose my Petra Berry, so that's about as good as that fight could have gone, so I'm really happy about that. And I still have Blaze, so I can just jump straight into this next fight and take advantage of that. Um, so being in that fight gave us access to Flame Charge, which is why we take that fight first. Because uh, this Grimer is really bulky in terms of special defense, so we would be... Uh, we would be stuck uh, spamming embers uh, a lot to kill this Grimer otherwise. So having Flame Charge is really nice because it makes it a two shot. Um, that's a death. That's not very good. I also forgot to save. So that's extremely awkward. That's alright though. Um, I should be alright with my step counter. Um, so the big thing that I'm watching out for is my step counter. Uh, I really don't want it to roll over before uh, catching my next main, or at least during the minute, which isn't very many steps. So it shouldn't be too big of a deal to... Um, for that. Um, so I'm going to be doing some number crunching on the side to make sure that that's okay. I do have to spend some time um, catching a Zubat anyway, so I can kind of pick that to my advantage if I need to. So we're just going to run back really quick here. Uh, we're going to pass this Lin Spinner here. Um, so we're going to be using a method known as Step Back, where I'm going to wait for her to turn. Now I'm one tile in front of her vision, and now I'm passed with flashing the menu, just like that, no problem. And now we're back where we started. So I can go right back into the um, fight now without much of an issue because I'm at full health now, full PP, all that good stuff. So there's no issues there. And I've already considered beating Billy Joe, so I don't need to worry about that. I can go straight into him. So the thing about the step counter is the step counter rolls over every 128 steps. Um, so I want to make sure that that 128 rollover does not happen um, while I'm doing my mission, which is about 20 some steps. That's a good crit. That kind of makes up a little bit for um, our oopsies. Uh, so now I'm going to be spamming Ember here to take care of coughing. And there goes my Pecha, which is fine. Alright, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to heal the full here. I'm a little too high health than I'm comfortable with. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to full and equip this Pecha Berry, and then I'm going to do the safety save that I meant to do um, before starting this gym now. Um, just so that uh, nothing else goes wonky on the split. Um, I've done pretty good at backing this up so far. The only thing I really need to be careful of is my step counter. So yeah, my backup is probably going to have to be buying some extra repels in Castelia, and I may as well buy some mess balls to make the catch as easy as possible um, of our next main, since I'm going to stop there anyway. Um, so with Rash here going into full health, this isn't a strategy that I normally have to deal with, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using a couple embers and uh, determining if I can kill coughing in three embers or not. Um, that doesn't look very assuring, so I'm going to go ahead and use the tail with some flame charge just to kind of wrap things up. Yeah. 
And then uh, hopefully here, Loki goes for Venom Shock. That's very good. So then I can do this. Blah, blah, blah. Getting double poison point there is not great. Uh, I'm not too worried about the poison though. Um, it's pretty easy to work with. Um, this actually means I have, well, being at 7 health means I have Perfect Blaze. Um, going into the next fights, which helps Rash a lot. Um, it's going to be a while until we get to those fights, though, is the only thing. Because uh, now we're going to have to go and enjoy the wonderful Force tutorial known as Pokestar Studios. So for those who aren't aware of Pokestar Studios, um, it is a... Uh, it is kind of a side minigame thing that was introduced in Black White 2 to go along with the musicals that were in Black White 1. Because uh, we don't get forced to learn about the musicals um, in this game. We instead get to learn all about Pokestar Studios. Uh, so it's going to be kind of a lot of mashing through there, and it's going to be a lot of me doing some checks to make sure that everything is fine. Um, because with my IV RNG, I want to make sure that um, that my IV RNG does not roll over as my step counter does when I get to our next main. So I'm going to be crunching a couple numbers during the movie here to make sure that all is well. This has definitely been a unique start to this run for sure. The crit uh, pit of and crit um, by Grimer has been very unfortunate so far. Uh, and it is a little bit my fault for not remembering the safety save. If I had some commentators, I definitely would have had them, like, screaming in my ear right now to tell me to save, but unfortunately all my commentators, uh, were, or my, my go-to commentators for White 2 are unavailable during this time, so I kind of have to run the show by myself here, but that's alright, because... Trust me, I can definitely fill dead air with lots of useful information for many hours, so. So here's Roxy's dad. Um, they're kind of getting into the movie stuff right now. It's quite the quite the slog here. He wants to show off this movie that he spent his like hard-earned hours like filming and acting in. Uh, so hopefully you all find it as enjoyable as he does. The nice thing about it is that it has the Guinness World Record for the fastest movie ever. Because that it topped the box charts with people watching it over and over and over again. All right, well, he tried. And lucky for us, we got what is known as fast credits. There's three different kind of credits that can appear on the end of the movie here. Um, the other two kind of have like, kind of split in the middle, half credits and half like the, the scenery of like the movie. So having that is nice because it's the fastest and saves us a little bit of time after our um, travesty of a Roxy gem.
But we're not in big worries. The time save, or the time loss has been very minimal so far, even despite the death. It only took us like a minute to get back, so we're, we're doing plenty fine so far, I can assure you. So now that Pop Roxy, I think his official name is, has shown us the movie that he put on for everybody, now I have to um, film one myself. So I am going to pretend that I'm very enthused to be here for this movie. Uh, and we come across Bryson, who was the seventh gym leader in Black White 1, but he's since retired to become an actor, I guess. Um, so we're going to go ahead and shoot this film. We're going to choose rentals. Um, I don't know if you can actually bring in your own, like, Pokemon into this movie for filming. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because we are given the same Riolu that um, we were just shown in the movie. And, which is really nice because it's really easy to throw this movie um, with this Riolu. So all we're going to do is spam Ice Punch, which does nothing to Ponyard. Uh, and we're just going to get wiped out by whatever Ponyard decides to move. Ponyard, Ponyard can one-shot us with anything, so. Uh, since we are using Ice Punch against Ponyard, there is a 10% chance for it to uh, become frozen. If it does freeze, um, what happens is that the movie gets cut early. The director's like, yo, what the heck is this? And cuts the movie off uh, early, so we get a little bit of time save, not having to watch Riolu, like, die out. Um, but freeze from an ice punch is only 10%, so it's not really worth going out of your way to attempt to have, like, happen. Like, it's definitely not reset-worthy. <laughs> so, now that we're finally done with the Pokestar Studio stuff, we can kind of move on to uh, the next big thing here. Um, there's going to be some mischievous things happening. Um, and since, since I have Blaze, I don't really need to be poisoned, and since this is a marathon run, I may as well just go ahead and get rid of the poison, so there's no, no more additional risk of things going wrong just because I'm poisoned. Uh, poisoned normally isn't actually a big deal in these fights, um, we can one-shot them, so they're fine, which means that we don't really have to deal with in taking any poison damage, um, most of the time, anyway. Uh, the first fight here is going to be against a uh, Patrat. This Patrat does have Detect, which obviously wastes a turn if it manages to use it successfully. Um, and since I am in Blaze, it is a guarantee for me to kill this thing with Ember, so um, I don't have to give this thing any extra turns in the turn that I connect Ember. Alright, so that's really good. Uh, if I did not have Blaze, which is very, which is usually the case when I am Rash, uh, that is actually a 15 and 16 range. So 15 out of 16 times I will kill that Patrat, and one out of 16 times it'll be left alive with like one HP. So um, really nice to have Blaze. Um, if I had the typical Rash strats, I would typically be right outside of. Uh, like Blaze, which is 21 HP at this point. Um, so I could, if I was poisoned, um, if I lose a turn, then I happen to get Blaze, and that's perfect. Um, so it's not the end of the world in that case. Well, that's not going to help my step counter at all, is it? Stop using the escape rope. My escape rope and repel were backwards, so I kept trying to use the other one, so... Alright, didn't get the Lend Pass, that's fine. I'm going to just step two step or be a little ways away from her. Wait for her to turn, which would hopefully be today. And then we gotta take care of this grunt that we have uh, chased down that ran away from the confrontation that we just had with them all. So this Purloin without Blaze would be a 50-50 to kill with Flame Charge, but since I do have Blaze, uh, I could just use an Ember and it kills no matter what, so that's perfect. Uh, 
as great as these grunt fights can go. So I'm really happy about that. Um, the limb passes have left some room to be desired, but it's not the end of the world. Um, spinners turn every 32 frames, so it's just kind of up to chance um, if they choose to turn um, when they decide. Um, so it's, it's intervals in 32 that they choose to turn. And then um, with me doing this, I kind of intentionally waste 32 frames to see if Lynn would spin back. Um, so there's a chance that she would have turned back before I... Um, before like I flashed my menu while I'm taking that step. Um, and that's how I know that spinner pass would not be safe. You'll see that kind of movement a lot in um, especially gens 3 through 5. Um, Gen 1 and 2, I think, kind of have their, like, slightly different methods for spinner passes. Um, but it's largely the same across every generation. Um, just how they do movement for si uh, safely passing spinners may be different. There are such things as spinners that are deaf. Um, so what a deaf spinner means, it's a, it means that it's a spinner that... Um, will not look in your direction when you're running near them. Uh, so a lot of spinners, uh, when you run by them, especially into their line of sight, they will intentionally look at you to, to catch you and force you to fight them. Uh, however, uh, not all of them do that. Sometimes you can just run by them for free and they won't look at you. Uh, when I was in the ranch, there was that youngster that um, kind of looked lost and confused as I kind of walked and ran around him and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, he is one that does not go out of his way to try to find me when I am running around him. And that's, I believe, the only example of a death spinner that uh, we care about in this run. So, so now we've entered Castilia here. Um, we're going to get access to the bike from this Harlequin. So it's really nice that we get the bike this early on. Um, in Black and White 1, you don't get the bike until you get to Nimbasa, so after three badges. Um, so it is definitely a welcome change that we get the bike earlier in this version. Uh, so what I went ahead and did there was I unequipped the berry bag because my berry bag was still kind of bound to Y to be able to uh, whip up really quickly in case I needed to re-equip Petches while in Roxy's gym. But now that I have the bike, um, the Y kind of shortcut is exclusively for the bike now. Uh, I could equip multiple things to Y in the Generation 5 games, and it kind of pulls up like this list menu of things that you can kind of select through to kind of more quickly access different menus. However, um, it's just not worth it compared to being able to have the bike quick on hand. So uh, we opt to not have anything registered other than the bike. On our way to Berg here, uh, we have to do some chit-chatting with Iris in order to get... Um, Berg to unlock. Um, so Berg is like hot on the trail of Team Plasma, I think is the deal is, and Iris is coming for like a gym inspection or to say hi or just happen to be in the area. I don't know. So um, we kind of have to trigger that exchange for um, Iris to kind of point us towards the sewers. And since I'm here, I should stop at the center and do some uh, backup shopping. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to buy one repel from you and I'm gonna buy some nest balls from you I'll just buy three and hopefully it doesn't screw up my shopping too much I got a couple different opportunities to shop so I'm not hello I'm sure that was very insightful but I don't have the time for what you have to say um, there's a couple opportunities for shopping so if I need to get a little more cash down the line that's fine Now, for me to capture this Zubat, I kind of have to think about what the best move is to use against the Zubat to weaken it. I think I can get away with a Flame Charge. That's... okay, that's not my Repel. I bought the Repel second, or first. <laughs> my, my menuing is going to be very screwed up for the rest of the run because of this um, this uh, conundrum I've put myself in, so. Just 
just some good old marathon luck requiring me to do some immediate routing on the fly. So I need to catch a Zubat in here before I leave, um, so that I have something for fly, and I also have something for the triple battles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus Sandile here because I'm in Blaze, just in case Duat does not kill. Um, because Sandile is a guarantee to kill me, or very close to guarantee to kill me at this health, um, I like to cover my ground and attack Sandile. Uh, Duat's Razor Shell is only 95% accurate, which means if it misses, it's kind of wonky. So I think my plan is here is I'm going to be um, I'm going to be using some what am I what am I talking about uh, so I'm going to be saving for my minip here um, I'm going to be manipping and catching a Drillbur, and I'm going to be checking its stats right away just to make sure that um, it is correct. If it's not correct, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset and catch Zubat, and then uh, come back and catch Drillbur. So I'm going to set my time here real quick. For Drillbur, which is our next main because he's so busted, I got some fancy key buttons to press here to boot into the game. Alright, so with this Drillbur catch, I'm going to be intentionally not mashing the beginning of this battle. Uh, this makes sure that uh, Drillbur always uses the same move, usually, um, while opening. And I'm going to use a Flame Charge to weaken it up, just so that um, it is a little bit easier for me to catch it with this Nest Ball that I picked up. Normally you would try to catch it in Great Balls, which is a 33% from full or about 56 if you weaken it with flame charge like I have, but since I'm using nest balls, this catch is pretty much free. Um, so now what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to give Drillbur a one character nickname. I didn't nickname my Tepig because it's not worth it for how little I use it. So we're just going to check things real quick. That looks right to me. Because 36 speed is as good as it gets. And I took a look, and the next IV um, frame is zero. So I think we're pretty set here. We shouldn't have an issue. Alright, so now um, one more thing that I need to do, though, is that I do need to catch my um, Zubat. So I'm going to be running out of here um, the slow way instead of using my escape rope and hoping that I get a Zubat right away here. Encounter rate is not great in here, so there's going to be a lot of running back and forth and hoping for... Uh, the Zubat to appear. I don't remember what are the odds of a Zubat in the sewers here, but hopefully it'll show up sooner rather than later. Alright, there it is. Oh, okay, it is 45%. Thank you, Tucker. I'm just going to use that Ember to weaken it. And then I'll throw another Nest Ball, and that should be my Flyer taken care of. Beautiful.
don't need to nickname that. And we'll go ahead and get the heck out of here and carry on with the run. Things should hopefully kind of normalize here now after... Um, hey, sorry about that, guys. My internet's not the most stable, so sometimes it tends to have a moment and is probably why a lot of uh, some of the choppiness is what you're seeing is likely from me dropping frames, so I'm sorry about that. I've been doing the best that I can in the kind of behind the scenes here to make things as easy for you guys to watch as possible, so I, I apologize if things aren't quite up to your standards for connection here. Uh, but anyway, we are in Berg's gym. Uh, so I went ahead and gave Drillber a EXP share that we picked up earlier. And that allows it to pick up some extra XP while Pig Knight is taking care of this gym. Uh, Pig Knight is a very good starter for this run because of this gym. Because uh, it's a fire type and this gym is bugged. Uh, we just destroy everything with Pig Knight. Which is really good because we're not quite ready to switch back to Drillber just because... Um, Drillber itself is not really great. Excadrill, its evolution, is phenomenal. Um, but as Drillber, it's not great. So that's why we're kind of gave it the EXP share. Just so that we can kind of help it out as much as possible um, to get to its evolution. Uh, we will be switching to Drillber as our main as soon as we finish this gym. Uh, but until then, it's going to be Pig Knight for a little bit longer. Um... So this Drillber is perfect in everything except uh, special attack. It's kind of a whatever stat for us for the most part. We're going to be using uh, physical attacks for the majority of our run. Um, it is also adamant nature, which is plus attack minus special attack, because again, we really don't care about the special attack that much. Special attack is useful for like one fight, and that's it. Uh, it also has the ability Sand Force, which boosts its... Um, uh, ground type moves in a sandstorm and there's only one fight that we willingly participate in that's in a sandstorm so uh, we really shouldn't have to um, worry about it that much uh, it just helps out a little bit if you can get that ability um, over sand rush which makes it faster in a sandstorm because you don't need the extra speed all right so i'm gonna go ahead and switch drillber to the front i'm also going to take another safety save here because i don't need anything else to go <laughs> wrong in this run <laughs> this run has already been uh interesting to say the least so uh now that we're at least back on track uh we should be okay here So we're putting Drillber in the front, even though Drillber, as I mentioned, doesn't do really good in this gym. Uh, because we need Drillber to get a little more experience than what the EXP share is already giving him. So EXP share usually gives Drillber a 50% cut of uh, what you get for defeating a wild, or for defeating like the enemy poke in battle. Uh, but if Drillber actually sees the enemy, then it gets 75%. So that's gonna help Drillber get a little more XP here. Um, than what it normally would have just sitting in the back pocket. It also makes this fight a little more interesting um, because uh, of all the juggling that I have to do between uh, Pig Knight and Drillber in order to navigate this fight successfully. Uh, like for example, critting Dwebel with uh, Pig Knight is not really good. Um, Sometimes, oh, that's not really good either. Um, I'm gonna heal this. I don't know if I really had a choice, because, um, Dwebel is faster than Drillber, and I think that's what about, um, Feign Attack is doing against me, so not much I can do about that. Usually you don't end up having to heal there, but that, um, Metal Claw miss was kind of devastating. This run really seems to be wanting to throw every curveball it can at me, which is... Making for a unique experience, to say the least. Alright, at least that went well. Um, when Levani comes out, it's going to use Razor Leaf, because it thinks Razor Leaf is the best move to use against Grilber. And Razor Leaf is a high crit move, which can make things awkward. 
uh, as Pig Knight comes out because I want to be able to tank both the Razor Leaf and Cut. Uh, it's also more awkward when Cut crits when Razor Leaf didn't. Um, but thankfully, that Berg fight, although the Battle Claw miss was kind of devastating, it was overall pretty smooth. So now, um, we since we swapped the Drillbird to the front of the fight before Berg, um, Drillbird's in the front now, which means it's officially going to be our main kind of for the rest of the run here. Uh, so we're going to head out here. Uh, while we've been in Castilia, I've been going to a couple of buildings and talking to some clowns. You probably didn't see me talk to one of them because of the technical difficulties on my end, which are unfortunate, but what can you do? Uh, so these clowns, if I talk to all three of them, will give me a rare candy, which I will use to help uh, push Drillbur along uh, to getting to um, Excadrill to make things um, simpler in the long run. Uh, in challenge mode, you'd be able to skip this candy just because of the extra XP you get because all the mods are stronger and whatnot. So. Now we're running into everyone's favorite scientist, um, blue hair swirl, swirl man, something rather. Um, so he's gonna start keeping an eye on our journey and telling us all about bringing out the power in our Pokemon and something, something rather. He's also gonna teach us how to count at some point. Yaka's giving us a dowsing machine. We have no use for it, but we'll take it. So this clown here is the last clown that'll kind of give us the candy after we've talked to everyone. So there's the rare candy there. I was actually paying attention to this dialogue once, so it was kind of concerning me because I was like, did I miss talking to one for some reason? <laughs> so that's all taken care of. Um, you can be really careful that I don't encounter anyone there. That breeder sees everything except for the very bottom tile. Uh, so I have to make sure that I'm careful to hug that like bottom wall there as I head uh, west on this route. So this is one of the couple of areas that have different layouts between black and white too. In white too, it's kind of this like desert hellscape looking place with a bunch of like ruins and stuff. In black too, they've like completely got rid of like the desert and turned it into like a half desert, half metropolis looking thing. Um, but since we're playing on White 2, White 2 is the better version compared to Black 2 for a number of reasons. Um, the biggest one is that um, The, the biggest one is that um, a couple of fights. Um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought because I'm thinking of like three different things at once. Um, so the difference between white two and black two, uh, there are a couple of areas that have different layouts and there are, uh, or at least there's one fight in particular that is a triple battle instead of a rotation battle in white two. So white two is better because triple battles are much better to handle compared to rotation battles. Uh, so that's why we opt to run White 2 instead. Um, also, because of the, some of the different layout changes in Black 2, um, optimal like movement through the world would require us to fight an extra like fight uh, in a particular area known as Reversal Mountain. So uh, we don't want to have to deal with that extra fight, so we play on White 2. Uh, oh, yeah, that is a good point. Um, the frigate is also slightly different between the two versions. Um, the puzzles kind of get flip-flopped a little bit. But no one likes to talk about that one because the frigate is just so much better in white 2 compared to black 2. 
So there was our kind of introduction and getting all the stuff set up for Join Avenue. We do not care about Join Avenue at all, so we're just going to zoom out of here as soon as we're done. Uh, and then in order to fight Elisa, we are going to have to take a detour to this like roller coaster kind of area here. Uh, this was the gym in Black and White 1, but in Black and White 2, um, it's just kind of like a like an entertainment area or attraction or whatever that we have to go through, so. The layout is exactly the same, it's just that there isn't a gym leader at the very end of this gym, or at this uh, building. So it's going to look strange that I'm pulling up the Pokedex there, but the reason I'm doing it is in order to uh, kind of manipulate the cycles of some of these coasters. Uh, loading the Pokedex like that just kind of scrambles them a little bit, and it saves me about six seconds, uh, I think, overall. Shout out to Dexie for finding that. Uh, but now we're kind of coming up to a really annoying part of the run. Um, because uh, if you've played either of the games before, you know the next gym that we're coming up to is Electric. Uh, a lot of the Pokemon have the special ability Static. Uh, static is 30% chance for me to get paralyzed uh, upon using a contact move. I am going to be using a lot of contact moves, um, most uh, notably Dig, to take care of everything. So every time I use Dig, which is basically every poke that I fight, because I pretty much one-shot everything, uh, there's a 30% chance for me to get paralyzed. So typically I'll get paralyzed twice. That's typically. Um, it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot better. I would definitely like it to be a lot better on a run going as well as it isn't so far. Uh, so you're welcome to start guessing in the chat how many times I'm going to get paralyzed. I already told you the average is two. We're going to deal with, uh, I think the number is eight. Pokemon with static. This is one of them, so we've just got past one for free. This is the static that matters the least though, because we're going to be going to the center in a second and doing uh, a PC heal to get our PP back and just heal the fold for uh, the gym itself. Even though we're next to the gym, it's just better to go here first and then go take care of all our stuff in the center and then come back to the gym. We just really don't have the PP to handle that, so. So I'm going to pick up this revive in the trash can here as kind of a safety. Um, we do have access to buying revives now that we've beaten the third gym. So I'm going to definitely stock up on a few for the rest of the run here. I'm also going to buy an awakening here for a really troll fight that comes up right after Elisa. Uh, more on that later. Ooh, not 13, I want 10. And then I can buy three revives, that brings me to four. So I should buy one or two more when I get to Drift Vale. And I know where at least one backup revive is if I need it. Okay, let's see, let's fix this here. Okay, so we're gonna PC heal Drillber and then we're gonna pull out um, our Zubat and our Psyduck. Um, because we're gonna be coming up in our first triple battle pretty soon, I'm gonna need to have three Pokemon in my party in order to participate and thus uh, progress through the game. Uh, so that's when I'm gonna pick up um, the Psyduck that I left in the box earlier. Normally there would also be a pit of there, but we all know what happened there. Um, the reason why I put Psyduck in the box after I beat the first gym is because there would have been a mandatory double battle right outside of Verbank that I would have had to participate in if I had more than one Pokemon in my party. So that's also why I wiped on, um, Roxy was because I only had one Pokemon in my party, although not that I would have had the revive to bring, uh, Tepe back to life anyway. So 
So this first fight, uh, this Flappy is 11 and 16 to kill with digs. That's really good that I got it. Again, 30% chance to get paralyzed with every uh, Flappy, Elekid, and Amolga in this gym. And there's quite a few of them, like eight of them, I think, eight or nine. All right, so there's the first static. So those that are keeping track at home, who have bet more than zero, are all rejoicing and hoping that I get more. Uh, that trainer likes to swap out her Elekid uh, because her Elekid doesn't have a move that can actually deal damage to me. Because I'm a ground type and ground has uh, no effects when being hit by an electric type move, so the electric type move is useless. The only thing it can really do is spam light screen. Um, it's not guaranteed that she'll switch out Elekid. Sometimes you can get away with um, Elekid staying in, which is nice. I forgot to steal static, didn't I? Let's get rid of that right away. Because I'm using Dig, which is two turns, I have to go through uh, two uh, Paralyzed checks, which are 25% each. So I really don't want to risk that. Because uh, my Dig PP is really tight. Up until I get a free heal shortly after the gym. So um, there's two. Not great. That one's also not great because it means I get beat up by Blitzel while I have to heal it, which is not great because it usually means I have to take a heal before Elisa. So, oh well. One last static before Elisa here. The statics that I get before Elisa aren't too time lost to heal. Um, any static that I get on Elisa is pretty rough though. So we level up to 26 just in time to get access to Slash, which is great because uh, Slash is a high crit move that we're going to be using to try to take out a Molga as quickly as possible. Uh, the plan is to use a Hone Claws and then be able to take it out with two Slashes. Uh, slash isn't guaranteed to kill in two turns. It's very favored at like 73 some percent. I'm not anywhere in my notes where I should be to have that number offhand. But it's very favored to kill in two shots. However, um, it's luck of the draw. And if I do get a good crit, I might be able to one shot it. So I went ahead and healed to full there, just to be safe putting into Elisa here. Uh, I do need to hit Amolga twice and Flaffy once, so there are three more chances to get paralyzed. So um, the people who guessed three are looking pretty good, four is uh, not looking most probable, but you never know. Things might get wonky and I have to use more slashes or whatever. Um, that's really good, I did about half, which means this should pretty much take care of it. That's really good, and taking no damage is really good too. Uh, not having static means that I can just go straight to using Dig here, otherwise I would have to do some healing shenanigans, and that's a really good Elisa fight. So for those who guessed two, congratulations. Lipstrika does have Flame Charge there, which is likely to kill me. It's pretty close at that point. But for some reason, it likes to use Pursuit sometimes, so works for me because it's less likely that I'll die. So with that in mind, that is four badges down, four more to go, and about two more hours of content at least. So I hope you're all excited. There's a lot of shenanigans to happen yet if uh, if the first hour is 
anything to go off of. So I'm going to go ahead and use our rare candy now to get to level 29, which is just in time for us to get access to Rock Slide. And we're going to get rid of Metal Claw for Rock Slide, because Rock Slide is just a better move. Uh, Metal Claw has also betrayed me this run. Um, and then I'm going to use a Freshwater to heal up Drillbird here. Just because I'm a little too low to comfortably go into some of the next fights here. I did not mean to talk to you. Alright, so now we're heading into some Team Plasma shenanigans again. These guys are just standing here and they're wondering why Hugh has such a problem with them. As if you shouldn't just naturally have a problem with Team Plasma. I don't know. I thought it would be obvious. Like, Team Plasma. Bad guys. Doing bad things. Known. For some reason I think they have immunity just because they're doing no bad right now or something. I don't know. Anyway. Ramble aside, um, these grunts are really trolly. Uh, this Trubbish isn't a real problem, but um, the Watchhog that's going to come out on the next grunt fight is really annoying. The Watchhog has... actually It actually has four moves. A lot of people think it only has three. It has four moves. Um, it has Super Fang, which cuts your current HP in half. Uh, it has Confuse Ray, which obviously confuses you. It has Hypnosis, which puts you to sleep, and then it has After You, but it never uses After You, so we don't care about that. Uh, but the other three moves that it is very likely to use are all very obnoxious. So I bought the Awakening in case I fall asleep, but I'm really hoping that I don't get confused. The best case here is when I come up from Dig, I crit it. Obviously, that's the best case. Um, but um, if, if I did crit it, uh, the next best thing is to either get Super Fang, because I don't get like a status uh, affliction, uh, or to have like hypnosis miss. Hitting through confusion is fine, but taking damage in confusion is the only way that you can really die. Because Super Fang only cuts your HP in half every single time, um, it takes like an exponential amount of time to like to die to Watchhog unless you hit yourself in confusion. So if Drillbur was to die and then Pitov was like or Zubat was to come out and um like try to like wrap up the fight or give me a turn to like heal uh Drillbur with a revive, Zubat could be sitting there for a while waiting to uh die. So Confuse Ray cannot miss, um, and it is a coin flip when confused to hit through. So you really don't want to hit self if that's the case. You're, you're favored to get through the fight without an issue, but when something goes wrong, it usually snowballs very quickly. Drillbur was picked up in Castilia Sewers right before the third badge. It is the soonest that we can get access to Drillbur. Because yes, Drillbur is a very busted mon. So, we were shown the wonders of the Hidden Grotto. We don't care about the Hidden Grotto. Uh, so, this is our first triple fight against Charles. And it is also the fight we're going to be using the one and only X attack that we have access to in the run. Uh, without shopping very, very late in the game. So, that's why I'm kind of doing the safety save here. Because there's no real backup to the X attack. And if something goes really, really wrong, uh, that would be not good. <laughs> to say the least. So that's our safety save. Um, Charles here has a Kakuga, Sigilef, and Archen. There are many ways that this fight can go really good or really bad, so without explaining them all, I'm just gonna tell you how things are going as they happen. So I'm gonna Rock Slide, Archen, and Siji. That should kill Archen, but not Siji. Uh, I'm gonna use the X attack with Zubat, and then Sadak is gonna stand there and take one for the team. 
I'm hoping for Psybeam on Zubat. That's really good. Now I'm hoping Rock Slide does not mess anything. Very good. Psybeam, that's fine. Psybeam does have a 10% chance to be confused. Uh, so I don't want to get confused, because then that's really, really bad. Because I don't have anything to heal confusion. And for me to take out this Tortuga, I'm going to be using Dig, which is require would require me to go through two uh, confusion checks. So it would be really unlikely to survive this fight if I was confused. So that fight went as well as it can, which I'm really happy about because I definitely don't need more time loss <laughs> in this marathon run. Alright, so now coming across the bridge, there's uh, the shadow or whatever there. We're going to ignore that. Thankfully, it didn't spawn in my way. I have yet to have a encounter on that bridge. So consider me very lucky. Um, I haven't talked about Phenomenon yet. Um, so way, 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 way back when I beat the first gym, I unlocked um, what are known as Phenomenon, which uh, is more commonly known as like your rustling grass or your dust cloud that I manipped my drillber out of or um, the shadows on the bridge, uh, the rippling water while surfing, all that kind of stuff. Um, they have about a 10% chance on average, to spawn um, every 20 steps. So I am being very careful when I'm out on like routes and stuff um, that I don't accidentally run into a phenomenon because that is time loss and we are speedrunning. It is not uncommon to go through a full white to run um, without hitting one. Um, most of the phenomenon can only provide a encounter. Um, the like, the shadows and the dust clouds are the only ones I believe that can spawn items instead, uh, as well as encounters. So if you do encounter one of them, you want the item because that is a lot less time lost than um, an encounter. That is interesting. I think for safety here, I am going to heal. You just hope that it's going to spam in prison. Yeah, that was a good call. Alright, and I got the range, so that's good. So yeah, that raid fight is kind of like the... The really awful, like, third act, or like, third movie of a series, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know, it's the sequel sequel? I don't know what the hell you call the, like, third iteration of, like, a series. Um, it's really bad because that Swoobat is a 10 and 16 to kill and has a tract. Uh, because I'm a female Drillbur, um, when I am in love, it is a 50-50 to attack, and that's not good. Yeah, the three cool. There you go. Thank you. Um, but now we're just in time for Drillbird to get to Excadrill, and I won't lie, I was kind of mashing B right before the evolution cutscene, so I'm really glad that <laughs> I paid attention a little bit. Um, but now Rude is going to give us a host feel about Team Plasma during the events of Black White 1. Uh, Hugh's really mad because he wants Purloin. We all know his deal. Um, but now that we have Excadrill, we can go ahead and uh, teach it uh, a move from the move tutor here in Drift Fail. Um, I'm going to say no to the Zoroa because we don't want it. Um, get in here. Alright, so this move tutor has access to the move Iron Head using the red shards that we pick up in Nambasa. So we're going to go ahead and teach that to Excadrill because it is a wonderful steel type move. So we get uh, same type attack bonus or stab. It is also really good because uh, it has a 30% chance to flinch the opponent, which we're really going to be hoping that happens uh, on 
a number of fights, actually. Um, this game is passionately referred to as the flinch game because Exedrill has both Rock Slide and um, Iron Head, which have a 30% chance to flinch. So um, if the enemy flinches, we basically get a free turn so long as we were faster, which is really nice. So now we're off to the fifth gym, which is Clay. So Clay um, is the ground type, and we're also a ground type, but we're ground and steel, so uh, ground type moves, I think, still hit us pretty um, aggressively. So the deal with Clay is that Clay has a Sand Slash that we cannot kill with two hits. And in fact, is not guaranteed to kill in two hits. Um, it is about a 91% chance for us to uh, kill it in two shots. So we're going to be hoping that we get that range. It's very, very likely. And it's not the end of the world if we miss it and I have to wipe or revive or whatever. Um, just because it's so likely, I don't think it's worth my time to save. all Because, you know, we still have time for content. So... May as well keep things interesting. This is the this is the scuffed marathon showcase of White 2 to counteract the White 2 showcase I did at USA Summer 2023, which you should check out on YouTube if you want to see what a good White 2 run looks like. Because uh, that one goes a lot smoother than this one, let me tell you. So... Uh, the deal is, is that Clay's Sand Slash is going to be going for Bulldoze. We're going to be hoping that we flinch the Sand Slash so that it doesn't actually get to use Bulldoze and drop our speed so that it becomes faster. Because um, Sand Slash will kill us in two hits if uh, we let it. So step one of the plan here, Krokorak has Intimidate. We're going to go ahead and throw Psyduck out there to take the hit so that we get our attack back because being minus one is really bad. And taking the time to like lead Psyduck and then switch its Excadrill back is just not worth it. So this lets us get our attack back and then we can Iron Head Krokorak with no problem. Um, now I'm going to be hoping that... Um, Sand Slash gets flinched here. Here's that 30% chance. That's unlucky. Not the end of the world. It's it's expected because it's only 30%. So uh, I just get to use one of the revives that I picked up in the plaza to pick him up. And then because the first hit was really good, I... I'm pretty confident that this will finish it off no problem. Excellent. And then Big finishes off Clay, so there's Clay. So although our so though our early game was extremely scuffed. Um, things have been going pretty well so far. So that's five badges done now out of eight. But it's going to be a little bit before we get to the next gym, so... Grab some popcorn if you need to. Or don't, because we're actually coming up on probably one of the best, like, post-game battle facilities. Um, we take a detour to get it showing off to us in the middle of the run, so uh, we have to go take care of that. But it is still arguably one of the best battle facilities, um, rivaling, like, the Battle Frontier. It's not as robust as the Battle Frontier, because the Battle Frontier has all the different... Um, rules and like facilities and that kind of stuff
Um, it is also really nice because it, uh, the PWT brings back all of the gym leaders from the generations previous. So it's really fun to see them uh, ride up to Generation 5 with their own uh, gym leader battle themes that are all a jam to listen to. Um, and you can fight them in like 3v3s. Um, level 50 kind of tournament style deal. Because it is a tournament after all. So we're gonna... Oh, by the way, Sword and Shield uh, reference with the statues. Can't believe no one knew Sword and Shield was coming in 2012 when like 2 came out. It's so obvious. So, alright. So, Drift Fail Tournament here. Um, we're going to be dealing with this bracket here. Um, there's some familiar faces on here and some random NPCs. Um, the deal is that this tournament is always scripted that we fight the uh, same people over and over. Or, like, it's scripted that we always fight Hugh first, Charon second, Chorus third. Because those are the only three um, significant people that we know in this tournament. Everyone else is NPCs who are there to just throw so that we always fight the same people. Um, and also because this is like a tournament thing, we don't get EXP in here, but our levels are also not capped, so we're still um, a higher level than everything, which is nice because it makes things pretty easy here. Um, except for when that happens, Duat is a 13 and 16 to kill, so... Um, it's not unexpected to have Duat survive there. It's not great though, because it almost always goes for Water Pulse, uh, which has a really good chance to confuse you, 30%, uh, just like uh, my Iron Head has 30% chance to flinch. Uh, but the rest of Hugh's pokes are all a pushover, so. This is just the marathon run that shows you everything that could go wrong. So, of course, I'm going to miss every single range. I just have to expect that going forward. So the next fight here is Charon, and it's going to be the first example um, where we see one quirk with the PWT, which is that um, our opponent's ability is random. So its, it's moveset is the same. Uh, its stats are the same, uh, but just for some reason, the PWT has a quirk where it likes to randomize the abilities sometimes. So, um, Charon's Stotland here has a chance to be either Intimidate or Sandrush. I would prefer Sandrush because then I don't have to waste a turn using Home Claws to get back to Neutral Attack. Um, also, I don't have to see the Intimidate proc, so okay. You know, it's very unlikely that I... Um, Salt one with Sandrush. So of course I'm gonna see Sandrush in this tournament or in this uh, marathon run. Like I'd say 95% of the time uh, I get intimidate. Yeah, another quirk thing here is that all the enemy folks have 30 IV, which is not expected um, to be the case this late into the run. Like you usually would not see 30 IV Pokemon here. You don't usually see, like, significant NPCs have 30 IVs until, like, maybe the 8th gym, usually, like, E4 and Champion. I don't know. I've never looked that deep at any of the stats in this run to tell you who are all the traders with 30 IV pokes, but... You get the gist that it's usually reserved for late game. All right, so now we're coming up to the finals here, which is rigged to always be Chorus. Um, Chorus is going to lead with a Magneton that has either Sturdy or not Sturdy. I don't remember what the other ability it, that Magneton could have is. Um, but we're going to hope that um, it does not have Sturdy so that we can one-shot it and dig with uh, Dig, no problem. Oh, it has Magnet Pull, okay. So yeah, Magnet Pull, we don't care about Magnet Pull. Alright, I'm fortunate that it had it. 
Uh, I avoided supersonic though, so that's good. Um, so I'm not punished for it having sturdy. It's more... I more often get it to be back and forth between Magnet Pull and Sturdy uh, with Magneton than I see with Stoutland. Stoutland I almost always see Intimidate. So to get Sand Rush is an anomaly, but usually with Magneton for me it's a little more 50-50. So there's the PWT cleaned up. Uh, other than those two pokes that I mentioned, nothing else is usually too big of an issue. Two or three. So with that all said and done, the receptionist is going to award us the BP, which you're all probably familiar with if you've done any battle facility before. Um, this battle point is not worthless though. We're actually gonna put it to use really quickly here. There's an exchange counter to the right where we can buy vitamins for one BP a piece. Uh, vitamins are what boosts what are known as EVs or effort values of your Pokemon by 10. So effort points um, go on top of your IVs to kind of help round out or make a stat even more powerful than what it already is. Uh, so you can kind of think of a Pokemon's stats being calculated as a formula of, like, say, its base stat in that particular stat, plus its IV, plus its EVs, and those kind of together make a stat. Um, so I'm going to be using the Carbos to be boost my speed later. I already used a Protein earlier to boost my attack a little bit. Um, every four EVs kind of helps um, raise my stat by uh, a noticeable amount. Um, so, uh, you'll also see me get a lot of EVs passively by beating Pokemon, um, but I'm not really taking any specific fights because I want to get these EVs over those EVs. Um, I just kind of end up with the EV spread that I get and I just roll with it, so. But I do pick up these vitamins to kind of help me boost a couple stats that I actually care about, most notably my attack and speed. So, Hugh noticed the Team Plasma Grunt run by, and all of a sudden we're on their uh, ship, aka their headquarters. That's a pretty good flinch. Uh, we're going to be dealing with quite a handful of grunts here, so it's a good time for snacks and a bathroom break if you need one. Um, however, um, it's Trubbish time, so I just want to make sure you're all aware of that. Um, <laughs> it's really funny. This grunt says, like, it's Trubbish time, and I think of Morbius every time. Um, every time I see it, so I figured that I would force that upon all of you now, so hopefully you're enjoying that newfound plot. Um, so now that we've taken care of these two grunts in a single battle, we're going to have to help out our uh, friends, quote-unquote, in double battles here. We're going to take care of Charon first. Um, Fighting with Charon is actually pretty nice. Uh, Stoutland is usually very cooperative in helping out. Um, I am going to be using Rock Slide here to start, and it is a 9 and 16 for me to take care of this Golbat, so I'm going to be hoping that I get that range, because that makes this fight a lot quicker. Alright, that's fine. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave Golbat for um, Stoutland to take care of. I'm going to take out uh, Krakarok with this Iron Head, and then um, it'll be a Life Heart that comes after the Golbat that I need to take care of. Missing the Golbat range is not great because it means I take damage. I don't want to take damage in this segment. Um, it's a pretty long segment though that I'm begging not to take damage, um, so I, it's just kind of in Fate's hand at this point. Uh, mainly because if I have really high health and get a really good Skylophite, I don't have to heal. You can save a menu, but it's not the end of the world. Um, if I have to heal. Also, because it's a marathon run, I'm probably going to end up healing anyway, so it's not the end of the world, but it, just something that in an actual high-level run I'd be kind of thinking about at this point is not taking damage um, is great. 
now we're gonna come and help Hugh. This is the first time that we, well, second time I guess that we fight along Hugh. Um, the trend with Hugh is that Hugh is worthless as a partner. He does not really help at all. Uh, I'm gonna be hoping that he uses Water Pulse on Coffin here and knocks it down. That's fine. Okay, I'll take Hit Self and Confusion. Um, it is a 1 in 16 for Duat to kill Coffin straight up with Water Pulse. Um, if it does get confused, then obviously it's a 50 50 to hit self in confusion and uh, kill itself like that, which is pretty good. As long as Duat cooperates on this turn now and uh, uses revenge, perfect. Um, that coughing also has self destruct, which could uh, clear it out pretty quick um, and make the fight faster for us, but it also means we take damage, so it's not the desired route. So getting the confuse there is pretty nice, I would say. I would take that in a PB run. Alright, so now um, Zenzolin, who is kind of the right-hand man to get us in this game, has kind of had enough of us um, wreaking havoc on the ship, so they finally kick us off. I don't know why it took them so long. It would have been a lot more convenient for us and for the sake of our sanity if they uh, let us go sooner, but whatever. Um, so now we're going to be heading off and doing our ideally last shopping for the rest of the run here. Uh, I'm going to be doing some kind of ad hoc shopping here to make up for some of the wonkiness that has happened in this run so far. So what do I want? I'm going to want my full heals. I'm going to get like five instead of the usual 11. I'm gonna buy 24 to be safe, and then how many revives does that get me? I'm gonna buy a four revives, and I'll buy one hyper just to just to keep things safe here. So I'm gonna be coming up on the spinner movement here. We're finally dealing with some spinners again, but now that I have the bike, I'm gonna be lightning fast getting past them, so I can just kind of wait for them to turn away from me. So that was all set up there. Um, as soon as Route 6 gets loaded in, they start kind of doing their thing. So as long as I have that movement, um, I can safely get past the first one. You saw her turn away like as soon as I got to her. At least as long as the stream wasn't restarting while I was doing that. Uh, so now we have um, another one, another spinner coming up. Weird quirk about this game is that the spinners kind of come in big clumps. Like, I have not dealt with the spinner since before the second gym, and now I have five badges, and I'm passing, like, four of them. Five, actually, in this whole kind of, like, stretch between the fifth and sixth gym, so... Uh, I'm going to be doing some special movement here like that to get past that one uh, because that one can hear you when you're running. Uh, I was intentionally running right up until before the tiles directly above her where she would see me and then I jumped on the bike to get past her really quickly. That keeps her from being able to turn and look at me um, so that I can get a safe pass. It's called Run the Bike. Um, it's pretty useful, or it's pretty used, um, especially in Gen 3, I believe. Run the Bike is used quite a bit. Uh, it's not used in Gen 4 at all because the bike is not that helpful for spinner passes, especially because of the acceleration and deacceleration that it likes to um, do. This bike um, is really fast at moving. It's uh, one second you're in standstill and the next tile you're on top speed. There is no like acceleration curve, which makes it really fast to navigate, but also really hard to control at the same time. So you might see me make micro mistakes here and there that require me to get off the bike just to adjust. So that was the only other run to bike that you'll see in the run. They're kind of back to back with the guitarist there and the scientist that I dealt with outside. And there was, I think, the first phenomenon that I've really seen um, so far in this run. 
I'm taking it slow around that ace trainer because that ace trainer is a triple battle and triple battles are not fun, even if they're optionals. I'm going to kind of wait for her because I kind of screwed up movement there and I don't want to get hit by her. I think she only has two pokes, but I don't want to deal with her. So I'm just going to take it a little bit safer there. And then move two tiles over here for the optimal cutscene trigger here. So we're going to finally meet Professor Juniper. Um, the only time we've seen her is at the intro and in the phone call. She sees that we've seen like 47 Pokemon and tells us good job, here's a Master Ball. I don't know why. We've seen less than a third of the Unibodex at this point and she's just handing us the Master Ball. Um, this is where I would be attempting to catch an Audino with the Master Ball if I did not catch Psyduck. I would have uh, ran around waiting for a Shaking Grass to appear and then jumped in it and used the Master Ball on Audino. So, anyway, we could go to Skylar's gym right away, but we're actually going to go follow up on Juniper. She went to Celestial Tower for, like, research or something, rather. So what we're going to do is we're going to go visit her, because um, she has a very good item for us to pick up from her. Um, and on the way, we're going to pick up this elixir here. Uh, because we'll need it to restore our PP while we're kind of out in the field um, later in the run. Uh, but Juniper is going to give us the Lucky Egg, and if you don't know what the Lucky Egg is, um, you're going to be amazed at what it does. So the Lucky Egg, uh, what it does is it gives us 1.5 times the EXP in battle. So what that's going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to skip a lot of trainers, because we are only going to be fighting the absolutely necessary trainers. And this game is really brutal, so using the Lucky Egg to get extra XP makes things really nice. Uh, especially because in this game, um, they kind of tweaked how you gain EXP in this game. Um, so you gain more EXP if you beat a Pokemon that is stronger than you. Um, or like higher level than you. And uh, we'll be taking advantage of that a lot to get extra EXP just because we may be just under leveled compared to what the enemy you're dealing with is. But it's also helpful in general with EXP. Um, it also stacks the EXP share, so if you are using the EXP share to like train another poke up, give your lead a lucky egg and you'll get even more EXP given to the one holding with the EXP share. It's really nice. So anyway, um, now that we've taken care of equipping the Lucky Egg and that whole detour, we also taught all our TMs that we need for the run. The only or HMs, sorry, the only HMs that we need to beat the run are uh, Fly, Surf, and Strength. And Fly is only because it's quicker to fly somewhere than it is to backtrack on the bike. Um, and now we're on our way to go fight Skyla. So Skyla's gem is pretty easy. Um, it's just kind of maneuvering around these drapes. Um, it's probably the most movement precision section of the run. Um, it's pretty easy to back up as long as you don't get caught in the wind. Um, any of these like green, like cubby looking areas are safe to be in when the wind picks up. Um, you can, if you, even if you screw up once, you can still kind of get there on the same, like, cycle. Um, just later in that cycle, so it's not a big deal. Um, but we are going to be taking another save here for Skyla, because Skyla is where we're going to be using our X-Speed. And losing the X-Speed and not beating Skyla is very bad. So, um, we're just going to make sure that nothing goes wrong, because then we would have, like, giga content trying to figure out how the hell to back that up. So now we got Swoobat here, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that X-Speed now so that we're faster than Swoobat. Um, Swoobat's Hard Stamp has a chance to flinch, so we want to be faster while we set up here with Home Clubs. Um, Swoobat does have Unaware, so the Home Clubs doesn't actually help. And it's a 12 and 16 for me to take care of this Swoobat because I forgot to use the Protein that I picked up. Did I pick up the Protein? I thought I picked up the Protein. Why am I using Iron Head? I should have just followed it up with another Rock Fly. Whatever. 
This is just all part of the content. Um, it's not a bad thing that we missed that Suvat range, though, because it means she doesn't have a Hyper for her ace, which is Skarmory. Um, so here, I can just kind of spam Rock Slide without having to think about it. If uh, she still did have her Hyper Potion, I would kind of have to gauge based on how much my uh, first Rock Slide did, if I would have to use the Iron Head to kind of just chip a little bit more health, but without knocking Skarmory into healing range. Um, AI that have healing items will heal if their poke is at 25% or less health. Um, so I want to do my best to keep them out of healing range when possible. But since Skyla already used the Hyper, I don't care about keeping an eye on that. So there's, there's six done without much of an issue. So another thing about Gen 5 that I haven't really mentioned is that when you get access to the HM, you can use it. Uh, there is no gym badge requirement like there are at a lot of other generations to use HMs. Uh, as soon as you get them, you can use them uh, in the field, which is really nice. However, in the case of coming back from Celestial Tower, it was still worth it to bike. Uh, just because the, the fly animation actually makes it slower than just biking back. So uh, I'm going to use my Hyper Potion here to heal the full because I'm coming up on a scary double fight and I want to be full health for that to make sure that uh, nothing goes wrong, uh, but we still get content. <laughs> um, oh, I, I should also do this. I should check to see if I did pick up that protein. I did. So I'm going to use this other protein that's going to boost my attack a little bit more. It's not something that you usually pick up in top level white two runner uh, runs. Uh, some runners may apt to pick it up for safety. It does help some ranges, um, but there are a couple where it doesn't, even though you really, really, really wish it did. Um, so it's pretty debated whether or not you bother with that second protein. And because I never bother to pick it up, it always escapes my mind to use it when I'm teaching HMs and equipping the Lucky Egg and all that stuff. So I didn't get to reap the benefits on Skyla, which would have made Swoobat a 13 and 16 instead of a 12 and 16. And it also would have guaranteed Sky uh, Swana instead of making it a 15 and 16. So Juniper is taking us to Lacanosa Town for something, something research or whatever about the legendary dragons. We're going to tell her that we have no idea what, we're talk what you're talking about and that your ideas are not good. Uh, and we're just going to kind of carry on here. I have no idea where that shaking grass is, but it did not get in my way. So who cares? Um, so this is the main area that has a significant difference compared to Black 2. Um, it would also require us to fight an extra trainer if we were playing this in Black 2 to like get out of here. Um, so that's why we play White 2, so that we can skip that extra fight. Um, I'm going to walk two tiles and do what's called an instant bonk there, which is going to look a little weird. But what it does is it allows me to just barely get past that ranger there without... Um, whoops, I didn't mean to talk to you twice. Um, without being seen by him. So that's um, really nice. I have not seen that before. Um, I, I know when that was possible, but I have not seen that here before. So, dust clouds, if an NPC runs over them, they just get deleted, which is really funny to see. Uh, another quirk about dust clouds is that they also can obscure trainer vision, so if they spawn in front of a trainer and you have an opportunity to get around them, uh, it's free time save. Good luck with the rest of the run, but it's free time save. Um, so it's really fun when that happens. Uh, very, very rare though. Um, and only a couple fights where you can realistically get it and it helps you. Uh, so we're going to take care of this Vibrava. It is a 13 and 16 to kill uh, with that second protein. Otherwise, it's usually a 12 and 16 or 75%. Um, that Vibrava had Earth Power, which does a lot of damage to me. Uh, so if I missed it, I really hope that I got that 30% flinch to take care of it. Um, otherwise, things just get really, really awkward. So 
so Musharna is pretty good. Um, I'm gonna hope that Musharna uses Shadow Ball here to help me finish Driftlim because um, Iron Head on its own is not good enough. But it did, that's good. I also flinched the Driftlim, which is nice because it likes to use Stockpile, which is a lot of text watching um, its defense and special defense go up as well as... Um, uh, as well as it using Stockpile means that Musharna can't always kill um, with Shadow Ball. It's very likely, but not 100%. It's like 85, I think. Um, but now we're coming up on the worst rival fight in White 2. So Andela Rival is really bad because his lead is going to be an Unpheasant. And Unpheasant has the move Taunt, and if it uses Taunt, I am forced to only use attacking moves for a number of turns. I'm going to be setting up uh, Home Claws on turn 1 to try to get my attack to plus 1. I really want to get to plus 2 though, so if I don't get Taunt, that's perfect, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, so I've got the worst of the two rival fights, uh, which means things are going to be kind of awkward here. I'm going to be using Rock Slide on Samra, and I'm going to be hoping that Aqua Jet does not put me in the kill range. Uh, Samrock's pretty much going to exclusively spam uh, Aqua Jet because it's the best move it can use. It went for revenge and I flinched it. Okay. That is not likely, but it is pretty nice when it happens because I, I unlocked like the secret ending of this uh, fight where I don't have to heal coming out of it because uh, Samrock just beats the hell out of me. So that's really great. Um, it's not very often that Samrock tries to pick Revenge. Uh, so usually I end up getting hit with Aqua Jet first and then I follow it up with Rock Slide and then he hits me one more time with Aqua Jet and then I use Earthquake to finish it. Um, or um, if the first Aqua Jet does a lot of damage, then I may have to heal and just kind of get Potion Locked for a while, which isn't fun. Um, so I'm gonna waste some tiles there to get past that Black Belt because um, there's a lot of lag coming through that gate, and it makes it so that he kind of ends up in different spots in his cycle. Um, and I don't want to try to react or guess what part of the cycle he's in. Or do that risky of movement while there's like a lot of lag on my screen, because it's very difficult for precise movement um, with that much lag. So um, I'm just going to take that safe. Picked up a max ether there. Um, we'll use that in a minute from now, so you'll probably forget about it by the time that we use it. But anyway, we're here in Lacanosa. Juniper is still doing more research. Uh, Bianca, who we ditched in Reversal Mountain because she wanted to do more Heatran research, just had a change of heart like the second we left and came to meet us in Lacanosa. Uh, and we're hearing some lore about Kyurem, who lives in Giant Chasm, which is in the like the back door of Lacanosa town. Um, we're hearing about how cold it gets here at night and how everyone is uh, scared of Kyurem. So the, like, the the city has giant walls around it to kind of protect everyone inside. And then like after like curfew in this game, which is whenever nighttime rolls over, um, everyone goes inside. Because my seed is um, has me at, what time is that? 6.55 PM. Uh, everyone is still out and about, which means there is a parasol lady that is under this bridge that I'm about to go under here. Um, she can get in my way, which isn't great. It's not a big deal, though. Alright, so now that we're done with that exchange. Yep, just like that, she can get in your way. So, I'm gonna talk to Hugh here. Hugh's looking for Team Plasma, and they just kind of plot convenience show up. So we're gonna have to do another double here with Hugh. Um, Hugh is still useless. Um, this is probably the fight I have the least consistency on, despite being a fight where nothing wrong should really happen. I am using a Rock Slide, which is a 90% accurate move, uh, which means that I could just flat out miss uh, when I don't want to, and missing here just kind of makes things awkward, especially if it's a double fight where like 10 million different like events could happen. So that's pretty good that I got it to connect with both. So I'm going to leave Golbat to finish 
or be finished by Samurott, and I'm gonna go ahead and take out the single iron head. Just like that. And then um, the Scarbador is then to an earthquake. I really want Samurott to not use Aqua Jet, which is good. Um, the Scarbador has weak armor, so every time you attack it, um, it procs weak armor and like the abilities affects the game. I forget what weak armor does exactly, um, but it's time loss to have it proc, so, um, so Samurott cooperating is nice. We're also learning our final moveset for Excadrill. Um, we're learning Swords Dance, which boosts our attack stage by two before we were using Home Claws, which just boosted our attack and accuracy, which helped a lot when we were using um, Rock Slide to make it 100% consistent. Um, but now we're going to be kind of in the dark with um, with accuracy, stuck with 90%. So not the ideal scenario, but not the worst accuracy we could be dealt with. So we're going to pick up that hidden rare candy there. Uh, that's going to bump us up one more level. Uh, we're also going to be picking up another vitamin. There is a Carbos hanging out right here. Uh, so that'll let us uh, boost up our speed just a little bit more. Um, let's see. So I'm going to use this candy now to get to level 43. And then I'm going to use these Carbos here. And that's all, so we can head out. I am... I think I'm full enough health that I don't need to worry about healing, so... That's good. Another weird quirk that I didn't know about Waitu when I first ran this game, there's a guy who's on like a 999 win streak on the bridge, and he forces you to fight you. To like cross the bridge to be his like 1000th victory except you beat him um so taking the surf around there kind of skips him which is nice but we also have to go down there anyway for the carbos so i'm gonna say no to the repels here because it's gonna be a while until we need to use repels again um so i'm gonna be um conservative with my max repels because i only bought about what is necessary to beat the game because I wanted to make sure that I had any extra money go towards healing items because I use a lot in this run. So we're coming up on the seventh gem. This is also the point in the run where if we needed X items, we could go buy them, but we do not need X items to finish the game. Oh. To get X items, you'd have to go out to Shopping Mall 9, which is on the route to the west of Appaloosa here, but uh, we don't need to go out there, so we're not worried about it. Alright, so I'm speed tied to this fracture at plus one. I won the speed tie, so I took no damage, that's great. Uh, I probably should have healed um, while I was on the water, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, after this fight here, though, I am coming up on another triple battle. It's the last one that we have to take care of in the run, so there's only two. Um, the deal with this triple battle is I am banking on a 75% range. Um, there's a 25% chance that I don't get the range, and if I don't get the range, things can get pretty ugly. So I'm going to want to make sure that, um, I do whatever I can to get this range, which unfortunately is not much uh, out of the way of just get lucky. So, um, I am going to be swapping Excadrill to the second slot in my party here. That way, um, it is in the middle of the triple fight, which means that it can hit everything on the field. 
because I will be using Earthquake to try and clean up the field in one fell swoop. Uh, so I want to make sure that I can reach everything. So the plan is, is I'm going to be using Zubat's turn uh, to heal Excadrill the full. I'm going to Swords Dance turn one to get myself up to plus two so that I actually have the 75% range. Um, and then Psyduck is going to be trying to get a Tail Whip off. Um, if it doesn't, then it's just up to the up to luck if I get the range. Swords Dance, Tail Whip. So let's see what happens here. Sometimes Psyduck can get it off. Well, there goes my safety net. That's fine. Okay, um, 128, so yeah, if Dredigan picks Revenge and I don't get the range, it's kind of GG. Alright, I got the range, so that's fine. Little scary, but we got through, so that's fine. That is kind of the last, like, really dumb run killer, is having to bank on that 75% to happen. But thankfully, it was a non-issue. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and head up to Drayden here, because we can fight him now. Uh, Drayden is the easiest fight in this gym. It's just gonna be a manner of setting up a swords dance, and then we'll just spam Iron Head to take care of him. No big deal there. Swords dance out of the way, slash, that's fine, because it does nothing to me. Uh, this Flygon is the whole reason I was using Carbos. Uh, I am just faster than it, uh, which also confirms that I got the right Drillber like two hours ago, when I was not sure if I was even going to hit the right Drillber. I got lucky. Well, I didn't get lucky, but I was just thankfully able to tell that I had a perfect uh, speed stat. Because what would have happened if I got the wrong Drillber is my, what would have been my uh, attack IV becomes my HP IV. What would be my defense IV becomes my attack IV, etc., etc. Which isn't a huge issue until um, my special attack IV, which is like 14, becomes my defense IV. So that would be a 14 defense Drillber, which is not good. Uh, it also meant that my uh, Drillber's speed would have went from 31 to 0. And a 0 speed Excadrill would cause a lot of problems for this run. So I'm really glad that we did not run into that issue. Alright, so now Drayden wants us to go to his house so that he can give us a, another kind of big lore dump here. Uh, nothing like too insane happening for a while here, so... Use your next bathroom break if anyone's looking for it. Um, unless they're really into cutscenes, then you'll probably want to hang around then, I guess. So Drayden's going to tell us all about uh, Reshram and Zekrom and Kiram and how Kiram fits into the picture. All that kind of stuff. Nothing too, like, fascinating for us as speedrunners who just get to sit here and mash A and B. Did I mention that there's no L equals A in this game? A lot of the DS games allow you to bind um, L equals A in the settings, which means that your L button becomes another A button, just so that it makes it a little easier for you to mash with uh, three buttons. You can mash with A, B, and L using, like, your right thumb and your left pointer finger just to 
make yourself even better at mashing without having to um, without having to like get creative with um, mashing only A and B. Uh, but the Generation 5 games, for some reason, removed that feature, so I am stuck with mashing just A and B. So what I do is I have my right thumb on B and my left middle finger. Um, sorry, I have my right thumb on A and my left middle finger mashing on B, kind of alternating the mash through text as quick as I can. And it seems to work pretty well for me, except when I forget that I need to do movement. So Team Plasma has come to do bad things. Um, they have now frozen the Opelucid City, which is not very nice of them. And we're going to have to chase them out of the city and figure out what it is that they are doing. So now is a wonderful time. If anyone has any questions about the run itself or Pokemon speedrunning in general, uh, or the marathon that is this is a perfect time to ask them in chat because I'm definitely just gonna be rambling nonsense for the next couple minutes as we fight plasma grunts We have to fight three of them before we get access to fighting Zinzolin uh, hiding in or hiding around the gym I guess he just kind of shows up in front of the gym after you beat the third grunt. So we're going to kind of work our way around the city kind of counterclockwise here. Why not run Black White 3 Genesis? So for those who don't know, Black White 3 Genesis is a... Uh, crystal ROM hack taking place in Unova, which is actually a really good ROM hack. Uh, don't run it, though, because Victory Road has, like, 16 mandatory trainers to get through. And it's a really long game in general. There's a lot of mandatory fights you have to take to get through that game quickly. I think that's our first rock slide miss, but it's on something that's not punishing, so I'm cool with that. This Golbat is non-threatening. There are a lot worse places than this rock slide. That was some clean movement. I am proud of myself for that one. I forget that my extra drill is in the nest ball. It throws me off every time I see the, the ball effect coming out. This wheezing has explosion, which is fine if it goes for it. It doesn't do anything to us, but it makes it a little bit faster because otherwise it's a key turn to take care of it, but double hit avoid, it's a pretty fast thing to have happen, so I'm not complaining about that. Um, so now we have to do the Zinzolin fight himself. The Zinzolin is about as uninteresting as the rest of the grunts that we have just now fought. We will be getting a free heal after this uh, fight, which is nice because we're starting to get a little low on uh, PP. But the one quirk about this heal is it also means that my Zubat and Psyduck are alive, and right now my Zubat is in slot 1, so if I was to uh, not correct that before the next fight, that would be interesting because then I have the Zubat versus the Pawniard. 
which is not ideal. So, Drayden's gonna replace uh, Zinzel in here, and he's gonna go break his, like, in case of emergency DNA splicers that he has at the front door. So it takes him all of two seconds to go into the gym and come back with them. Uh, but unfortunately, the Shadow Triad is gonna jump in and swipe it out of our hands. And then they're gonna scamper off and we have to go chase him down. So we're just gonna maneuver through the ice here and find this one to fight. I don't know if there's actually more that you could fight. And I forgot to switch Zubat to the front, so Zubat's gonna be dealing with Pawniard here. Um, so I guess while I'm at it, I might as well do this. I'm gonna sack Zubat. This isn't the most marathon friendly strategy. But we may as well add some content. So, typically, you would keep Zubat alive as a backup for Marlin. Um, which is all fine and dandy. However, um, I have risky strats where you can opt to, Zach, to sack Zubat on this fight. Um, and what that does is it prevents you from having to sack Zubat later. Um, and to do it later, you have to go out of your way to sack Zubat. Like, you have to go into the Pokemon menu to send a Zubat out, uh, and then it gets sacked and you send Excadrill back out. Um, so what I'm thinking of doing for the content is to showcase not doing that, <laughs> which means things are probably going to go very wrong for me, because why not? Marlin is not a free fight by any means, so I am... Definitely at risk to have something go wrong. It's usually fine, though. Like, if Marlin's nice, he's really nice. If he's not nice, um, yikes. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. It is probably one of the last, like, really variable fights before the end of the game. After this, um, things kind of start to all kind of look the same or like be consistent amongst runs. Um, there's not a ton of variability up until I'd say Marshall, which is the first Elite Four member that we're going to take on. That's another fight that can go many different ways between really fast and really slow. So now we're off to Hemelal City. Um, we're hot on the tail of Team Plasma after they escaped from setting an Opelucid City uh, into chaos and grabbing the DNA splices and all that stuff. Uh, but before we take care of the Team Plasma stuff, um, the game wants us to take care of the 8th gym, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Uh, for some reason, he was just like, yeah, we're hot on Team Plasma's trail. Go fight the gym leader. Instead of you know, staying hot on Team Plasma's trail for whatever reason, but anywho. Um, so Marlon's gym is a water type gym, which is not really good for us as a ground type. However, we're so deep into the run and we are higher level, so a lot of these guys are fine to deal with. Um, there are a couple of ranges in here. Um, well, I guess there's really only one range. Um, and that was the one rock slide that could make things interesting, to say the least. Uh, so this gym is definitely has a theming to it. Um, as I go across this bridge, I'm going to be on the very top row of it there. What that does is it causes an, uh, a rotator that's always rotating to spawn in a little bit differently. Um, it's that ace trainer there, how he's always kind of spinning around. 
Um, he is deaf, so he won't like turn to look at us, even if we run around him. Because uh, we will need to jump up on his um, dock in order to kind of readjust the next uh, lily pad that we're getting on. So this gold duck is a 15 and 16, I believe, with all the proteins that I have chugged to this point. It also has soak, which can make the Starmie interesting if I get soaked, which turns me into a water type and I lose my stab. So as we're coming into Marlin here, uh, my ideal Marlin fight starts with it either uh, starts with Caracosta, either getting a flinch or um, using Shell Smash to try to like buff its stats. I really do not want it to use Scald, and if it does use Scald, I really do not want to get burned. Scald, I believe, is a 30% chance for me to get burned, just like with uh, Paralysis and all that other fun status moves. Alright, so that flinch is really good. That pretty much guarantees me to have a clean Marlin fight, so uh, not having Zubat alive is fine. Yep, and the Nisha pretty much guarantees it there. Um, this Whaler does have Bounce, also has Scald. Um, but it going for Amnesia means I just have a clean fight, so... Use my last Earthquake to finish up Jellicent, and that is eight badges. And probably an hour of content left. So now that we've beaten Marlin, Marlin's going to go right off into the sunset. To the north. To do whatever. I have no idea. Oh, let me actually run here. Uh, and now Marlin approaches us from the south, somehow. I don't know how he made that loop so fast. The dude can swim like hell. Um, so Marlin has no idea what's going on with any of the Team Plasma stuff. He's like, well, you really think they're that bad, huh? Are, are you sure? Like, he's, he's just completely oblivious to anything that Team Plasma has done. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and use our um, Max Ether that we picked up just before Lycanosa Town uh, to restore Earthquakes. Because we're not going to get another heal for a while and we're at full health, so uh, may as well just get our uh, PP restored so we can just keep going without having to stop at the center. This is actually quite a long stretch that we're not going to be going to the center. We're actually going to be using um, an elixir of some kind later, even. Um, the plan is to not take an, a center for the rest of the game. As long as no other content occurs. That's a nice rippling water. So this swimmer here is actually a spinner, uh, but it is not worth your time to wait for her to spin uh, because when she moves up to challenge us like that, um, we can get around her and it cuts off a little section of the route. It also cuts off what would be the actually mandatory fight um, that is kind of on the corner that we're skipping by being able to just go straight below her. 
Uh, the one downside though is that this spinner does have two Remor Raids, whereas the other one has one Octillery. So we do have to waste an extra Earthquake PP there, but it's not like a big deal. Okay, this is also a section that has been theorized to have the equivalent of a black plasma skip. Uh, so if you've seen like the sock alt main run earlier this week, you or this weekend, you probably saw uh, a new trick known as plasma skip, where you can use dust clouds to get past certain trainers. Um, it has been done in this area before, where um, a rippling water chained into a dust cloud has been used to skip uh, this ranger and the swimmer that I didn't fight on the route prior. Uh, and it does save about 20 seconds if you pull it off. Um, but the actual like process of finding seeds that can uh, give you uh, the potential to route out that skip has not been fully refined yet. It's probably one of the bigger research things that I've been working on over the last couple of weeks to adapt what has been discovered um, for Black White 1 to make work into Black White 2, but it has been um, a process, to say the least. So we went up to Terrakion to get the Chorus Machine to get past this uh, Crustle because that'll allow us to go on to Frigate 2. Uh, so Frigate 2 has um, one big gimmick, which is a puzzle that we're supposed to solve. Uh, the puzzle is that we have a password that we need to punch into a terminal in order to progress. For us to solve it, we're supposed to fight a bunch of different trainers to, um, or like a bunch of different grunts to get clues into what the password is. Uh, however, our password is actually derived from our trainer ID. And because I manipped to the very beginning of the game, I know exactly what my trainer ID is, and thus I know exactly what my password is. Um, the formula for those nerds out there who are interested is just your trainer ID mod 256 mod 5. Uh, that mod 5 uh, is because there are five different passwords that it could be. Um, there are three number passwords, which are 2202, 7707, and 9909. Uh, and then there are two word passwords, um, which are both Reshiram and Zekrom. The ideal is to have a number password because punching in a word password, A, it's a lot more characters that you have to punch in. Four versus like what, Rishram's eight or nine characters. So because of that difference, it's nice to uh, have one of the shorter number ones. Also uh, typing on a keyboard that is laid out A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, uh, like it is in like the default like nicknaming screen is kind of a pain to do. Um, there is like an option at the bottom to open up like a QWERTY keyboard so that you can at least, you could punch it in like that because everything would be laid out like QWERTY. Um, however, it is still time lost. You'd rather just get a number password. Um, so to start this fight, I'm gonna Iron Head Golbat and I'm gonna hope that Survivor does nothing to Samurai. Uh, Hugh will heal Samurott if Samurott's at 25% or low HP. Um, and that Poison Jab from the Viper there pretty much guarantees that uh, Samurott is going to be useless for the last turn because he was going to be busy healing it to full, which is time loss. But there's not really much I can do to control that because I want to use Earthquake to get those both off the field quickly. Uh, I am going to be using an Iron Head on this Garbodor too, which is a 13 and 16. So not having Hugh... Um, heal would not only save time watching that HP go back up, but it would also allow me to uh, have backup for that 13 and 16 range. But I crit it, so who cares? I'm just mumbling now.
So this is the barrier that's blocking us until we get the password. Um, for us to actually be able to punch in the password, though, we need to go find a key card. Um, so we're going to head down into the barracks here to find the grunt that has the key card. It is always the same grunt in the same location, so it's very nice in that regard. There is no, like, need to argue, manipulate who has the key card or anything crazy like that here. Um, so this puzzle in white 2 is a like in this frigate in white 2 it is a find the grant with a key card punch in the password and move on in black 2 this is actually a warp puzzle so um the rooms here would actually be like bedrooms and um the bedrooms would have a bunch of warp tiles to other bedrooms or um, four different switches that you need to step on to deactivate the gate. So, uh, we have to do something similar to that later. Um, so, we'll get our fair share of the run around and find all the switches, but that puzzle is a lot better in white, too. I think. I think the. the Frigate 2 in Black 2 is really awful because of the different puzzle that you have to take. Yeah, according to Prabs, you have to skip like six spinners. So that that's a lot of time loss waiting for spinners to turn around so that you can uh, get past them for the, for the buttons. So... We're going to go ahead and punch in the password here. I have the best password, which is 2202, because the 2 and 0 are right next to each other. 9909 would be technically the worst because of the distance between 9 and 2 when you're trying to like punch all that in. But it's not like a big deal if you get 9909. You would rather you you would be happy with any number password. I just happen to have the best number password with this seed. With all the RNG manipulation of White 2, there are a lot of seeds that you can hit. Um, especially with new RNG development stuff that's been worked on uh, by March and a little bit by myself. Um, and that's allowed us to be able to um, have a lot more seeds to play with so we can find very like optimal drill movement and very optimal tepigs to have good passwords um, and waste very little steps to get um, to get what we need and no encounters and all that good stuff. Uh, Samurott missing Aqua Tail there sucks. So we're going to be in an interesting situation where I'm out with Weavile and Watch on. Yeah. So I'm going to use a rock slide here uh, because Weavile's pressure makes me not want to waste um, any Earthquake PP trying to take it out. Um, it is a really bad range to take care of Weavile though. It's like a 2 and 16 or something. And Samurott not taking care of Watchhog also sucks because now I have to take care of Skolipede all by itself. So Samurott is kind of proving itself to be really useless in this fight. That's for sure. I just get to sit here and spam rock slides. Rock slide PP, I do not care about. My iron heads and earthquakes, I'm very I'm paying very close attention to. So now we're kind of figuring out that Team Plasma has Kiram and it's very scary that they have Kiram and that's why they froze were able to freeze the city and all that stuff. Um, we're just going to get kicked off by the Shadow Triad, though, so we're going to be going back to the beach while everybody um, on the ships, like, implode because of the sheer force that the ship, like, shoots out of the water. Like, everyone is just, like, a bearskin rug at this point. Because of how, like, forceful it was exiting the water.
So we're going to be coming up on the next fight, uh, another Plasma fight, once we get into the Chasm. Um, that fight would be the fight that we would attack Zubat on if we didn't already kill it. So I'm going to be saving some time by not having to do that. Uh, which is really nice. It's not something you want to do in a marathon or as your first ever speedrun, but, you know, it works. So we're going to fly back to Hippolyte so we can get to the giant chasm. Uh, we kind of have to backtrack back up the way that we went to get to uh, Terrakion. Get on the bike, will ya? Sometimes this game just eats your get on the bike movements, and I don't understand why. Movement was really clean, though. I'm happy about that. It is. It is an art to get good at the bike. I have no idea where that dust cloud was, but I'm really glad I didn't hit it. As as you can see, these um these places are only one tile wide, so it's really easy for me to hit a dust cloud if I am not careful. But there's not really an option for me to get around it. The only way I can get rid of the dust clouds would be to inter to like reload the area or interact with the strength boulder that's uh coming up here. Um that one. That'd be another way to get rid of a dust cloud without having like go all the way back and reload. Um, I am going to step in and out here because uh, what that'll do is that'll set my escape rope to that location. So when I'm kind of done with uh, all of this stuff here in the giant chasm, I can use the escape rope to warp back to right there, which is super nice. Because we're technically not in a cave right now, so it's really nice that the escape rope lets us um, escape the other cave that we're going to be in on the other side of the giant chasm, and it brings us all the way back outside. So this wheezing has explosion, and it would be really nice if it explodes, because then I uh, save an iron head. I have a lot of iron heads to work with though, so I'm not too worried. That's a really good explosion. Guess I could have iron headed that just because I have so many, but that's whatever. So a little bit of a cheeky slide puzzle here to get up onto the frigate for the last time. Uh, we're going to be coming up on what is called the ambush double because there are two grunts kind of waiting to jump you as soon as you go through this door. And they're very excited about the fact that it is an ambush and really, um, really drill it into your head that you're getting ambushed. Um, so this double fight has a Scrafty that does a lot of damage to me. Uh, but what I'm going to do to play it safe is I'm going to just use uh, Swords Dance turn 1 to guarantee that range. It's completely optional whether or not you um, want to go for the range or not. Um, if you miss the range, you could just flinch and it's fine. Um, but otherwise it does have high jump kick, which I believe is about 90 accurate. And if it misses, I think it hurts itself in recoil, so that would help finish the range if you got really, really lucky. Here comes that Scrafty now, so I'm going to take it off the field right away, because Golbat is not intimidating. Golbat does very little damage to me.
Uh, I guess I could have plus two iron headed there. But that's fine. If I saved that earthquake for a while, I could have um, routed my TP management a little differently, but it's fine. Um, basically, I could stretch uh, my the, my moves PP all the way up to chorus if I wanted, um, but um, I can use the max elixir that I'm about to pick up like right now, and it's still fine. It's kind of an advanced thing to try to go for it. Um, you really have to be conscious of your moves um, TP as well through the section to like even try it, and. Just depending on the situation, you may even have to just gamble um, rock slides in order to make it happen. Um, so it's not always super worth it. Uh, but here's the second puzzle. It is the um, warp tile puzzle that um, mirrors the the other puzzle. Um, this one's really easy. Um, the tiles always take you to the same place. Uh, and the way that I like to remember it is I just like to start down the left side and skip the first tile. And then if you just hit every single tile you come across, um, you can get through the whole thing like no problem. You just gotta be a little careful around those grunts because um, those grunts can hear you. And if I don't go that one up to be right up against the, the, um, like the way out, I can get hit by them. So I gotta be... Really careful of that. I'm also going to make sure I bonk that wall just so I'm away from that guy too because he's got some interesting pokes that I don't want to deal with. I really don't want to take any extra fights here because A, my PP is really low and B, they're not necessary, so why would I want to fight them? Um, so now we're coming up on the last time that we will fight Zinzolin. Uh, Zinzolin fight is still boring. We're just going to spam Iron Heads and that'll take care of him. Uh, but because I also used the Max Elixir already, I can use an Iron Head on Weavile, even though it has pressure, no worry. Otherwise, I'd try to be using a Rock Slide to save my Iron Heads and Earthquakes if I didn't, to try to get away with Chorus Elixir, um, or um, just say screw it and use an Earthquake or an Iron Head. Any move that I use will kill Weavile. Uh, but it's just, which one do you want to sacrifice 2 PP to... To use on it because of because of pressure and usually the case is rock slide or iron head or you just don't care about earthquake so all right well chorus is ready to teach us how to count now so we're gonna do that usually for us to use chorus elixir we would save one iron head and one pp uh, and use the max, uh, use an elixir, not the max elixir, just a regular um, elixir. And what that would do is that would let us stretch our PP all the way to uh, get this, where we get a free heal. It would also let us um, it also let us save a turn against the third Ponyard, or the third Shadow Triad fight that's coming up. But it doesn't matter if you use the max elixir now, you just use the elixir in Elite Four and vice versa. The only real difference is what moves um, you end up using. I have to think about that one for a second. I've either impressed myself or cursed myself with how well I've been doing without notes. I've been really bad at keeping track of where I am in my notes. But I also am very familiar with this run because I've been running it for almost a year now. It's coming up pretty quick on a year. I think it's only like two months away or so. It'll be one month of running like two straight.
Which, you know, in a year of white 2, I've gone from... Who are you? To... Third place. So I'll take it. So, Chorus being the, like, lawful neutral he is, says... Good luck with the rest of Team Plasma. I will no longer be in your way. Yes. The only reason I am third place is because of all the people who have routed and programmed RNG manipulation before me. I am a poser. So here's Getsus in his sick gaming setup with like 15 monitors or something like that. I don't know how many there actually are, you can count them out if you want. Uh, so Hugh's gonna get the conclusion to his arc, he's being given the purloined now life card that was stolen from him a long time ago. And we have to take care of some Plasma Grunts. Well, the Shadow Triad, I guess. They're, they're a little higher ranking than Mirror Grunts, I suppose. Uh, these Triads are pretty simple. It's just a Earthquake, Iron Head, Earthquake, back and forth, back and forth. Um, the only difference is that one of the Shadow Triad members has an Excelgor. And Excelgor has a cute little move called Me First which is a priority move that makes you copy what the um, what um, your opponent is using. So I'm going to be using Iron Head against Excelgor, but if Excelgor uses me first, Excelgor will be using Iron Head against me first, which means I have a 30% chance of flinching. Which is no bueno. So this is the grunt with the Excelgor. So get ready for another opportunity for content. Because uh, I only have one Earthquake left, I'm going to be using two Iron Heads on this Ponyard instead of uh, Earthquake. And I got a good flinch there, which is nice. Uh, I have more than enough health to tank anything that Excelgor throws at me, even for multiple turns. Alright, so here's that me first. Alright, I did not flinch, that's very good. And then here's our last Earthquake on the Pawnee Yard here. So we only have one more fight uh, before our free heal, and it's uh, usually a one-turn fight. More on that later. Alright, so now we are on our way to the final standoff between us and Getsus. <laughs> I went for task strats. Um, on stairs in ice, uh, there is no like sliding stuff, so you can like try to take one right onto those stairs and then go down to save like two dials. It's a complete meme strat. I just figured I would go for it for Marathon's sake. Alright, so now here's Getsus. He's really pissed off at this point. Um, he decided to take Kiram and bring Kiram into this cave for some reason. Yeah. 
and Kiram is going to take us out with Glaciate, and it's, uh, you know, GG, go home. We're dead. End of the run. Except... A Rusharam comes out of nowhere. Which means it can only be... The man, the myth, the legend, the freak without a human heart. Everyone's favorite one character... person. So now, uh, Anon gets us. They're gonna have their little heart-to-heart -heart under the best theme ever. I love this theme. Embracing one's duty is... a very good tune. It's a shame you don't get to hear it more in Black White 2. You get to hear it a ton in Black White 1 when, um... When the, uh... End's Castle comes and, like, crashes into the Pokemon League. Uh, but now... Some bad stuff is gonna be... Happening. Kiram got access to the DNA Splicer, so now... He has unlocked his, like, special ability to just... Shoot laser beams and capture Reshiram. Uh, which is not good for Reshiram. Reshiram is gonna... Try to evade... Kiram, who is acting like an AA drone right now. But unfortunately, Kiram gets caught and regresses back into the Light Orb, which is no bueno. And now they're gonna combine into White Kiram. Just a seed from Top Gun, whatever, dude. So now Kiram is very scary, um, except it is very weak to Steel Tech moves. So we are forced to take it out in order to progress. Um, this Kiram has random stats. Because it's a wild. It is very likely for us to kill it. There are sometimes some Kiram that can survive on Iron Head. But you need to have like a really bad Iron Head roll. Like a min roll. And Kiram needs to be just a tank. Get Lou! Yeah. It has not survived in the history of me playing White 2. I have... Well, actually, no, I lied. It happened to me once while I was practicing for ESA. When I did a ESA marathon run last July, which you should check out on YouTube, by the way. Um, that was when I had it live on me. I've never had it live in, like, an actual run, though. That was just practice. 
So having cough not protect on turn two is nice because then I can just uh, carry on with attacking here. Do be a little sad how the man went through all the trouble to be stopped by little mole guy. Well, he should have got a little mole guy. That was the real truth. Oh, oh, come on. That's the worst rock slide to miss for this reason. Flamethrower has a 30% chance to burn and it's really obnoxious when that happens. I have no idea what the Rainbow Rocket gets this has for a team in Ultra Sun and Moon. I never played the Rainbow Rocket section. I mean, this is a pre-recorded message. Alright, so Team Plasma is all taken care of. All done. And realizes this and says, alright, peace out. So Hugh is kind of recovered from having a mental breakdown of finally getting his Proline back that he never thought he'd see again. And we are clear to go to the Elite Four and beat the game. So we're going to go ahead and use our escape rope to get the heck out of here. So that'll put us back at kind of the midpoint of Giant Chasm here. It's a little quicker to walk in than to just get back on the bike. Now I'll get on the bike and hope I don't get a dust cloud. All right, good. That was a pure YOLO. All right, well, that was pretty clean. So I had no idea what cycle that spinner was on. There was a very good chance that I was dead. Or not dead, but I would have been seen by that um, spinner. And obviously we would like to not encounter another spinner. Alright, so we're going to go through a uh, badge check here, the classic. Definitely not as cool as... Um, Black and White's Victory Road. I really like their badge gate with like the whole build-up as you go through like each gate, like the music builds up more and more. I really like that gimmick of this theme. But even without it, this, uh, this theme is very good, so... It's always a treat to listen to this theme. Four trainers that I have to fight in Victory Road. Um, the first two aren't very interesting. Um, the third one, I'm gonna really hope that I get a flinch. And then, um... ooh, yeah, I'm trying to think about this for a second. Um, 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to heal probably before the third trainer. So I think I will do that as I am doing a pass on another spinner before it. So another thing with spinner passes on the bike is even though I'm two tiles away from where a spinner can see me, it is still considered safe just because the bike is that fast. Whoops. I'm going to get off the bike here for a spinner pass set up. All right, got the first. Perfect. And then I'm going to go ahead and use the hyper here. Because I'm a little low health, if I don't get a flinch and I get hit with a bad move, um, I'm going to need to heal on a sock coming up. I did not need to walk through that. Uh, but it was still safe. Um, that spinner is deaf. I don't know why I'm still walking. Um, but that guy can't hear me as I run around him. Uh, I guess I lied. That's the only other deaf spinner in the whole run that we deal with. And me flashing the menu around that veteran was me checking to make sure that, hey, is it safe for me to still go? Because it's hard to react if, say, on that tile is when he turned away. Because obviously if I didn't menu, I would not have really seen that, and that would have been interesting to say the least. All right, so that Ace Trainer Spinner was really nice. I've had hers be stuck for like 20 seconds and not turn. It was abysmal. It was on a, not an awful run either. So the sock has uh, Brick Break, which does a lot of damage to me, and I'll have to do another heal if uh, I get hit by it. Hopefully I don't. Hopefully I get flinched or it just doesn't do anything. Yeah, okay. So, unlucky. Alright, so this veteran um, has some YOLO strats where you would skip using Swords Dance and uh, just spam Earthquake and pray for some really good ranges. Um, obviously in a marathon setting or in a typical PB setting, it's not really worth it. It's only really worth it as like a, a dire need to save time, like you're on the cusp of a PB or a world record or like a barrier that you want to like break or something like that. So. Not something you really want to mess with on a typical run, but if you're desperate for time save, you can just skip Iron Head. The big thing, or Swords Dance, sorry, not skip Iron Head. The big thing about it though is that this throw is like a 7 and 16, so it's not great. And with that, we're coming up on the last rival fight here. So Hugh is a lot less scary on this rival fight compared to when we last fought him in Undella Bay. Or Undella Town, I guess. Um, Samurott no longer knows Aqua Jet, which means it can't outspeed us, so we will always one-shot it, no problem. 
Um, this Unpheasant does have Swagger now, though, that I'm hoping I don't get perfect. So I will go ahead and... I could have Iron Headed. I don't know why I didn't... My mind just went to the Rock Slide for some reason. That's fine. I don't need Rock Slide PP, so it just saved me an Iron Head, I guess, in case something goes wrong and I need to, like, back it up in some really jank way. So I have one Earthquake exactly, which is just enough to get through Marshall, um, which is the only Elite Four fight that I need to get through before I use my Elixir. I have a lot of Iron Heads left over. I'm not sure why I have so many extra Iron Heads. Oh, I know, because I Earthquaked uh, everything on the last fight instead of just spamming Iron Head. That would be why. So that's why I have exactly one Earthquake for um, Marshall. That makes a lot of sense. Hmm. That's a little quirky of me. Alright, so we're going to jump straight into the Elite Four here. Um, Marshall is the first one because... Uh, we really don't want too much, like, experience from the other ones before fighting Marshall. Um, our level is kind of perfect to two-shot anything that we cannot one-shot in Marshall's, um, team without also knocking it into healing range. So we're kind of in that sweet spot right now, and having too much XP could actually make this fight a bit of a problem. So I am going to be really begging that I get as many flinches as I can on this fight um, and useful crits. This is this is the fight that you really want all your flinches and crits on, to be honest. Um, this throw is a two shot, so I'm going to hope for a flinch or a crit. Uh, Rock Tomb, speed drop, I need to send out Psyduck to get my speed back because otherwise we're going to have problems. Speed drop is just not good for us on this fight. And that's where getting a flinch would have been really huge, is saving the need to swap in and out. Getting a really good marshal is not very likely. I've also spent a lot of my marshal luck up because, um, in my most recent PB, which got me, which is a 31027, uh, also in little third place on the boards, uh, I had literally the best martial fight you could dream of. Uh, okay, that's really good. Um, critting that Conkleder um, is a huge time save. Usually you would expect a flinch there. Alright, and that flinch is really good. So that's actually not a bad martial. That's actually really good. The only thing that would have made that a little bit better was flinch throw, and what would have made that, like, literally perfect would have been crit throw. So, that is... That is a marshal that you will take without problem. It is usually expected that Excadrill needs to either be swapped out because of the speed drop like I had, um, or, uh, it dies and has to get revived using a max revive. Uh, we do get, since we got max revives from, um, Rude and Giant Chasm, we can use them here if Marshall is particularly rude and we don't get the flinches that we need. Alright, so this is the fight where we're gonna go ahead and use our, uh, elixir to heal up. Uh, where is it? It is right there. Because um, Lipard always goes for Fake Out turn one, uh, so it's no point trying to set up Swords Dance otherwise. And then because we used a regular Elixir instead of a Max, what we're going to do is we're going to Earthquake out. Otherwise, if we use the Max Elixir, because we saved it, uh, instead of using it during Frigate 3 slash Giant Chasm. It's trivial, though, as I 
said a while ago. Alright, and that's Grimsley down. Um, so we have a lot of health, so it's it's kind of up in the air depending on your health, which fight you go for next. Uh, I have really good health, so I'm going to be taking on Chantel next. If I was really, really, really low on health, what I would do is I would fight Caitlyn, because on Caitlyn, uh, we're going to use a full restore to get to full, and then I can come back and kind of do Chantel with full health instead of uh, having a little lower HP, so... Not a super big deal here. Um, I'm really hoping that Kafagrigus does not get or does not burn me because uh, it does have Will O Wisp. Um, it's not the end of the world if I get burned, but I would have to heal it, which would be an extra turn, obviously. All right, that is very good. And then uh, the rest of Chantal is fairly trivial. I do have to rock slide the Drift Blim. Drift Blim is the last, um, the last rock slide that I have to use for the run. So, really glad that, that one connected. So that's what, I think two Rock Slide misses the entire run? Which isn't too bad. Um, one of them was on a meaningless fight. Uh, pl uh, one Plasma Grunt in the Frozen City. So that was... I didn't punish me at all other than losing a turn. And then um, the Rock Slide miss on Getsis was the, the one that kind of hurt. All right, so now we're going to fight Caitlyn last. Um, one of the big reasons that we fight Caitlyn f last is because A, she's free. B, she has the least text, even when you uh, fight her last, because a lot of the Elite Four members have extra text to tell you about how the champion is waiting and stuff. So uh, fighting her last just means we have the least amount of dialogue to deal with. Um, it is also where we use a full restorer, because Musharna is can only attack us if it puts us to sleep and then uses Dream Eater. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna spam uh we're gonna spam swords dances until Yawn finally puts us to sleep, and then what we'll do is we will use the full restore to wake up and get healed to full, and then we'll just sweep Caitlyn, and then uh, we are full health for the champion, which we need every HP that we can to make the champion fight as seamless as possible. Alright, and with that, that's the Elite Four down. So now all we have is the champion to take care of. So the champion is not a free fight. Uh, it usually doesn't have an issue. Um, but this is a marathon run. You never know. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, most notably, Iris's High Dragon has both Surf and Flamethrower, uh, which both moves suck to get hit with. Uh, but Flamethrower sucks more because Flamethrower actually has a chance to burn me, and getting burned is really bad. Like, bad, bad. 
So I would really prefer it if I did not have to heal or kind of dance around the fact that I'm burned. I still do have um, Psyduck alive, or no, not Psyduck, I have Zubat still alive. So I at least have one poke as backup if something goes wrong. Um, but hopefully, like, nothing astronomical happens. So I do need to set up a Swords Dance here. Uh, so that's why I'm going to be kind of taking a hit from Hydra I got and hoping nothing bad happens. Surf, that's fine. Perfect, it didn't crit. Alright, that's perfect. Alright, so from this point out, this run should be pretty free. Uh, I don't need to do any safety healing. Um, Iris' Haxorus can be pretty scary. It almost never goes for an attack, uh, which is nice. Usually it always likes to set up D-Dance, especially at around the health that I'm at. Um, I am going to be using an Iron Head to bring it down to 1 HP. It does have a Focus Sash that so always gets a turn off, but I'm hoping uh, instead of getting a D-Dance, it just flinches. Unlucky. But that's fine, because Iris is going to spend this time uh, using a full restore on Haxorus, and then I can uh, finish sweeping it with an Earthquake. Alright, and that's pretty much GG at this point. Um, there's nothing really else that can go wrong in this run, so um, enjoy the music, I suppose. Alright, and with that, we are the champions of the Unova League. And GG's to us. So we got about a minute of mashing here. Time is going to be on when the Hall of Fame kind of final screen fades to black. Um, the final screen shows like your game time and trainer ID across the bottom, so as long as that uh, fades out, that'll be where time is. So I want to thank PSR TV for having me for the marathon. It was a blast. This was a very scuffed run, but somehow it turned out all right. Um, watching a Zubat get admitted into the Hall of Fame is pretty cursed, but um, still really glad that this run was able to finish in plenty good time. Uh, time is coming up here in just a second, and time. So, thank you all for having me. Uh, you can follow me on Twitch at TTS for Life if you are interested in watching me grind more white 2. I'm trying to bop Skoagogo, who is the current world record holder. Shoutouts to him. Uh, also, shout out to Minnow, who's kind of caught in the crossfire at second place. Uh, this was a blast. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of PSR TV, and I will catch you all in the chat soon. I will be back in two runs from now. There is a Baton Pass run coming up in just a second here with uh, Head Bob that you guys should check out. And then right after that, I'm going to be back with Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Glitchless Manipulus with uh, Rubentus, Elwo, and Tucker. So you guys don't want to miss that race. There will be a lot of shenanigans, uh, way more than. Uh, what was in this race, or not in this race, but this run, so um, thank you all for checking out PSR. Uh, PSR is a great community. If you guys are interested in getting into Pokemon speedrunning, there's plenty of discords to, uh, across all the generations and consoles. Uh, we can 
definitely point you in the right direction and show you guys how to get into speedrunning. 